following programme is recommended for those 16 and over as it contains sporting violence, possible bad language and flashing imagery. We welcome you to Fight Night in Texas. Just west of downtown San Antonio sits Boeing Center at Tech Four, the site of the biggest win to date in the career of Jesse Bam Rodriguez. But will we see local history be made by night's end? We'll find out. It is Rodriguez Gonzalez later this evening on the zone. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. From the four corners of the world, to the four corners of this room, the fight still is now. How do you like it? Close the show. There you see an aerial shot of Boeing Center at Techport, the venue where Jesse Bam Rodriguez declared himself as one of the top rising young stars in the sport last June when he wiped away one of the kings at Super Flyweight. Sarisa Kent Sorungbasayani is back in this building tonight looking to make local history, trying to become San Antonio's first ever two-division world champion. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Before the Bell in San Antonio, alongside the former junior welterweight champ, Chris Algieri. I'm Justin Shackle. It's Jesse Bam Rodriguez and 23-year-old Mexican Christian Gonzalez in the ring tonight, the main event for the vacant WBO World Flyweight title. Jesse Bam Rodriguez's 2022 was one to remember a world title win, two subsequent world title defenses, and then what did he do? He gave up the belt late in 2022, all to go back down to 112 for an opportunity here against Gonzalez, win a belt, perhaps unify, and maybe eventually become undisputed in 2023. But that's something that we could talk about with both of the top matches here on this card tonight. Two world title fights, part of a loaded lineup, and we have the lightweight classes in the sport all being showcased. Big reason why is because so many are willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one another. It's it's a real fight fans card tonight, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. One, one, one of the banes of, of boxing's existence at this point is that a lot of the, the higher weights, like you mentioned, they're not fighting each other. We've got undefeated fighters at welterweight, we've got undefeated fighters at, at lightweight, but these lighter weights, these guys get in the ring and they fight each other, and that's why it's such an exciting division and also an exciting time because we, now we're showcasing these smaller guys. You have Rodriguez, Gonzalez in the main event, Akhmedaliev, and to Palace in the co-feature for a pair of the Super Bantamweight World Titles. Let's take a look at the full running lineup for you here in San Antonio. As we get going on before the bell, it's going to start off with 18-year-old Jesus Martinez going up against Jose Lopez. And then Khalil Ko makes his debut in 2023 against Chicago's Jimmy Queter. Mark Castro back in the ring. Trying to improve to 10 0 against Ricardo Lopez. And then the main event in Before the Bell, Israel Matrimov, the dream, back in action for the first time since July as he takes on Houston's Rafael Egbakwe. So, four very intriguing matchups in our show. Which one stands out to you the most? I mean, I always like when Mark Castro fights. I mean, he's exciting. He's, he's got a huge amateur background. He's been in exciting fights as well. It's not just going out there and blowing guys up. And he fights tough guys. So this is, he's, he's in there tough again tonight, you know, trying to get to that 10-0 mark, which is a big milestone in, in any young guy's career, uh, any young fighter's career. So I'm always looking forward to Mark. This is another eight-rounder for Mark Castro. He's hoping that it is the last eight-rounder. He can move on to 10 rounds after tonight. But in our first bout coming up in a few moments 18 year old jesus panterita martinez who you see there on your screen locally grew up around san antonio from nearby del rio texas getting ready to go this will be his third time on a matchroom show he's looking to stay undefeated hasn't been easy for this young pup but he has shown the ability to overcome some early and maybe some young adversity while on the ring. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of that, you know, he comes prepared for that because of the time that he spends in our Robert Garcia, Garcia's gym and training with those guys. There's no easy sparring days on, in that gym. So he's been in deep water with really good fighters, just not in the fights yet. And we're, you know, we're seeing that he's He's had a couple bumps along, uh, along the way, but he's figured out a way to win, and that's what's important. And he's in for a tough matchup tonight because Jose Lopez 
has kind of punched above his weight, even though we're here at around 120 pounds. There's a catch weight involved for this one, but he has impressed recently. Oh, absolutely. He's a, he's a, he's a New York guy. I know him from the, the circuit over there. He's he's there to upset the apple cart. That's that's what he's brought in to do. Um, that's that's what he knows that he that he's here for. Um, so it's yeah, it's going to be an, another tough outing for for young Jesus Martinez. He is from Ridgewood, New York, a neighborhood of Queens, and. Jesus Martinez, he and Lopez going at it in the opening bout here on Before the Bell as we count down to Rodriguez Gonzalez in San Antonio. There you see the focused 18-year-old. He turned pro at 17, but as we know, it's really tough to gain some consistent burn as a 17-year-old. Not too many places will commission you. Turned 18 back in January, and now he's ready to be unleashed, so to speak. Stay really busy as a young pro. Yeah, you know, he, he, he's learning on the job, which is a really difficult thing to do when you got no headgear and small gloves on. You know, but this is a tough, tough business to be learning as you go, but he's doing it so far so good. And Martinez, a 14-time amateur national champion. He'll be leading us off here on Before the Bell. Let's focus on the main card because there are four matchups that just jump out at you. We talked about the main event, obviously the co-feature with Akhmedaliyev back in action as well, but the two preliminary bouts on the main card that you're going to see on the zone beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern, Thomas Matisse. He's had a sensational last five months or so. Inked the multi-fight deal with Matchroom. Now he's trying to defend his WBC Continental America's super featherweight title against Ramiro Sassano, who's getting his shot here in the U.S. tonight. Matisse is trying to take another O this evening. Yeah, I mean, he, Matisse is one of those guys. He can just fight. He is a very good fighter. He's always in a tough fight. If, even if he's fighting guys like way above his grade, he figures out, figures out a way to either make it close or win. I, I, I expect big things for him. He's got a lot of promise. So we have the epitome of a crossroad fight here at 126 pounds. Raymond Ford, Jesse Magdaleno, Ford up and coming, 24 years of age, trying to will his way to a major world title shot. He's calling out the names, Lara, Wood, whomever could stand in his way at a title at 126. But right now, it'll be the former world champ, Magdaleno, trying to get back and climb to that world perch of being a world champion. Aside from Jesse Bam Rodriguez, who we all know I love, this is the fight that most interests me on the card. I think it's a great matchup, and it's a, it's a big ask for Raymond Ford. Jesse Magdaleno is an excellent, excellent fighter, former world champion. Huge step up in class with Raymond Ford. Co-feature, Mirajan Akhmedaliev fighting for the first time in 2023. He only fought once last year, but it was in this room. And he impressed because he hurt his hand early. He was able to knock out his opponent late in the fight. And he's making his fourth title defense here against the former champ, Marlon Tapalis, who's trying to become a two-division world champ himself. I think this is going to be a barn burner. These guys are going to go right at each other. I, I was speaking to Martin Tapalis' team. They said he's in phenomenal shape mentally, physically. So this is going to be a, a stern test. But Akhmedaliev, man, he is a total beast. So I'm, I'm really excited for this one as well. Bam Rodriguez, Christian Gonzalez, the main event. You know what I noticed from Bam Rodriguez this week? For maybe the first time, he's shown that he has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder because there are a lot of people who felt that his defense against Israel Gonzalez on that Canelo Triple G card in September was a lot closer to the judges' scorecards. He heard that. He's ready to prove him wrong here. Yeah, I think also he's cutting weight again. Yeah. You know, so so he's, he, he's thinking about that chip on his shoulder for something to eat. I mean, he's hungry. And uh, that, that always makes a fighter a little, a little more aggressive on fight week. Let's take a look at some of the uh, action that we're going to have here on Before the Bell again. Martinez versus Lopez leading it off. This was the footage from the weigh-in yesterday in downtown San Antonio, right along the Riverwalk. As Jose Lopez took the scales, and Jesus Martinez weighed in as well. And it is a catchweight at 120 pounds between Martinez and Lopez. As Martinez tries to stay undefeated and continue to impress at a very young age. Lots of family and friends for Pantorita in attendance tonight here at Boeing Center at Techport going up against Jose Lopez. And we are ready to go for our opening bout here on Before the Bell. Without further ado, let's get the night started with David Diamante. And David Diamante coming up in a few moments in the ring. We mentioned this venue. We really like this venue. It's nice, intimate, and David's ready to go.
Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to San Antonio, Texas. We are live on the zone for a big night of World Championship Professional Boxing. We begin tonight with a full round affair in the Super Bantamweight Division. Now making his way to the ring, please welcome self-made Jose Lopez. Well, right out of the gate, we got a quality nickname. Self-made, Jose Lopez. Nothing's been given, everything earned here so far for the 24-year-old. He is 4-2-1. and one. He's originally from Puebla, Mexico, but he lives and trains in the Ridgewood neighborhood of Queens in New York City. And he is coming off a majority decision victory over Robert Rodriguez in December. He's won three straight against fighters with more experience so Jose Lopez has gained some valuable rounds over the last calendar year or so. Jesus Martinez is one of the more inexperienced pro fighters that Lopez will be getting in the ring with this evening. Yeah, he looked to be in phenomenal shape at the weigh-in. And now entering the arena, please welcome Jesus Panterita Martinez. Eighteen-year-old Jesus Pantorito Martinez, he made his pro debut last year on a matchroom card in Mexico. He fought again on the Rodriguez Sorung Vasai card in this building two weeks later. And his last fight was just before his 18th birthday back in November. He recorded his first stoppage against Israel Camacho. He is the 14-time national amateur champ. He's trained by Robert Garcia, and he resides in Del Rio, Texas. It's a border town just 150 miles west of San Antonio. And he has said that his goal from a young age eventually be a multi-division world champion. And Martinez is routinely trained and sparred with Bam Rodriguez and Joshua Franco as he tries to become a solid young pro. But two division world championship aspirations and he's learning from Bam Rodriguez, who's trying to do so tonight here at Techport. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, good evening and welcome to the Boeing Center here at Techport in beautiful San Antonio, Texas, USA, for a big night of World Championship Professional Boxing. We are live on the zone, and the whole card is being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing. We're sponsored tonight by Bet Online, O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day, and stage front. All of tonight's bouts are sanctioned under the auspices of the Texas Department of Licensing and Registration. The chairman is Rick Figueroa. The executive director is Mike Ares Mendez. Introducing your three judges scoring our first contest from ringside. From California, Sergio Caiz. From Texas, Ellis Johnson. And from Nevada, Dave Moretti. And at the sound of the belt, your third man in the ring from Puerto Rico, referee Luis Pabon. And now, ladies and gentlemen, four rounds of boxing scheduled in the super bantamweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, wearing the black trunks with the Mexican flag. He scaled 118.4 pounds. His professional record, four wins, two defeats. He has one draw. He fights out of Ridgewood, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome self-made Jose Lopez. Lopez. And his opponent across the ring fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the black trunks with the silver trim. He scaled 119.4 pounds. His young professional record thus far perfect. Three fights, three victories, one of them coming by way of knockout. He fights out of Del Rio, Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jesus Pantarita Martinez. Martinez. 
Okay, guys, I give you instruction in the dressing room. Let's have a clean match, okay? Good luck. God bless you. Pretty good crowd to start us off in our opening match on before the bell. Jesus Martinez, lots of support here at Boeing Center at Techport, taking on Jose Lopez. Again, a catch weight at 120 pounds, four rounds to start us off on before the bell alongside Chris Algieri. I'm Justin Shackle. Jose Lopez in the Mexican trunks with the black trim going down the side. Jesus Martinez wearing the all black trunks with the white and silver trim. Has that Costa Zoo style haircut. And Lopez is one of those guys you don't want to let the record fool you. He's 4 2 and 1. He has no knockouts, but he's got a lot of experience against some pretty tough guys so far. He earned a majority decision win over Robert Rodriguez back in December. And Rodriguez was 10 1 and 2. And that came on the Terrence Crawford David Advenician card. Martinez doing a good job controlling the center of the ring, keeping Lopez on the outside. Martinez catching him with a left, coming in. Nice little in-and-out counter there from, from Martinez. A little pull-back, left-hook, right-hand combination. Lopez, 24 years of age. Jesus Martinez again turned 18 in January. He's hoping to be active for around five fights in 2023. As he comes forward here against Lopez. Martinez is uh, flashing a snappy left hook so far. He's hooking off the jab well. He's using that sweeping hook, and then sometimes he cuts it a little bit. It's a, it's a pretty effective punch. It looks like it's got some pop on it, too. Ooh. Good two-punch combo. That lands for Martinez. Lopez coming up empty on the big right-handed swing. And they're back in the middle here in round one. And Martinez doing that slick little head roll to make sure that punch didn't didn't hit him. Looks like it just grazed him, but big swing and a miss there from, from Lopez. Martinez looking a lot lighter on his toes compared to when we last saw him here in June. Yeah, I, I see I see big improvement, absolutely, Justin. I mean, he, 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 he's moving much better. He looks a lot more confident. He looks more physical. Yeah, I, I like what I'm seeing from, from Martinez so far. Martinez trained by Robert Garcia. He's managed by Darren Barker and Joe Calzaghe. Oh, and he catches Lopez with a counter right hand. Now angling. And Lopez held on to that right arm of Martinez. The sneaky little right hand right down the middle. Split the guard of Lopez as he was coming in. Combo thrown by Martinez in the final 10 seconds. Jesus Martinez looking very comfortable here in the opening round of Before the Bell. Jesus Martinez controlling the tempo in the opening round, a four-round match. Could be perceived as a sprint to the finish here. Chris, what would you like? Yeah, I, I like a lot of what Martinez was doing. His movement was very good. He was very sure on his feet where he wanted to go. He was, he was showcasing the right hand and the left hook throughout, landing some nice clean shots on Lopez in that, round, in that first round. Robert Garcia in Martinez's corner, so Robert Garcia... In the corner for the very first fight of the night, he will be in the corner for the very last one with Bam Rodriguez against Christian Gonzalez later here in San Antonio. Robert Garcia, one of the busiest men in boxing. When I work these shows, I'm always like, oh, Rob, you're here, you're here, you're here again? Yeah. Ooh. Lopez trying to spoil Martinez's perfect record and coming in at 4 2 and 1. He's the Mexican. Lopez landed a good left hook to the body a few moments ago. 
with a right-handed attempt as Martinez falls to the floor. Leaning on Martinez was Lopez. Lopez earned a draw in his pro debut back in 2018, and he followed that with a loss to Emmanuel Rodriguez. He didn't pick up a win as a pro until he was 13 months into his career. That's why, that's why that nickname sticks, self-made. Mm -hmm. He stuck it out. Oh, he pumps a big right hand to the body of Martinez. Comes back with a left hook. I like the adjustment Lopez has made. He's, he's targeting the body now. That was a nice little right hand shuttle punch there, sh sh shuttle punch there that caught Martinez in the body. He's having trouble landing to the head. You saw those those little movements from Martinez and roll with shots. So now Lopez is targeting the body and doing so effectively in round number two. Martinez caught him. He met him with a left hand upstairs. Martinez did a good job of setting traps. He's, he's pulling away as Lopez is being aggressive. He's, he's, he's using that 3 2, that hook right hand combination, just like that, to have Lopez walk into shots. The one thing we're watching for here with Jesus Martinez, he gets into rhythm, gets in a flow, had great success in the first round. You see him punching with Lopez, but we've also seen him become a little overconfident in his very young career. He admitted so. He says, yeah, I, I could be overconfident at times. And it's something that he needs to learn to, I guess, manage better. Yeah, I think he's, uh, you know, he, he, like we talked about from the open, he's learning on the job. He's so, so young in his, in his career. But I, I'm seeing him be smarter than usual tonight. I think he's staying very composed and within himself, and he's utilizing it, what's working and building off each. Ooh, big Lopez right with a right hand. We saw Jesus Martinez take on Kevin Monroy here in June of last year. Monroy dropped Martinez in the third round of a four-round fight. Martinez came back, finished really strong in that fourth round. And here he's in a battle in the second round with Jose Lopez. That's a tough thing about a four-rounder. Oh, a right hand turns the chin of Martinez. Oh! And a left hand to the belt by Jose Lopez. Trading big shots here. Jose Lopez with a very good comeback round in the second. Here we see that combination that I was talking about from Martinez as he backs out, he throws that hook right hand combination, which has been effective throughout. There we saw a body shot and left hook upstairs as well. And Lopez pressing, pressing, pressing. Trying to close that distance. Bayer lands a nice overhand right that partially catches Martinez on the chin. There's another one. That one a little higher on the head. Lopez coming on a little bit in that, in that second round. I still gave the round to Martinez, but... Jose Lopez has won three in a row. All for a fourth straight win here in Texas. It's the sixth different state that Lopez has fought in as a pro. Road Warrior. And originally from Mexico, lives and trains in Queens, in New York City. And there may be a tape issue on the glove of Jesus Martinez as we begin round three, scheduled for four, and our opening bout, catch weight at 120 between Martinez and Lopez. Ooh, nice feints there from Martinez. There's another one. That, that shut Lopez off. It's nice to see a young fighter doing such advanced moves. The hook off the jab, the feints, the in and out movement. Oh! They both exchange left hooks to the body. Big right hand from Martinez upstairs. Yeah. Martinez needs to be careful trading hooks with Lopez. That, that Martinez left hook is getting a little bit wide here in these last couple rounds. You don't want to get caught trading hooks. But a guy like combo Lopez. from Jesus. Left hook upstairs by Panterita. It means little panther in Spanish. Lopez continuing to come at the 14-time amateur national champ. Big swings and misses from Lopez. Martinez is using nice movement. He's not wasting any energy. He's tying up when it gets too heated. Okay, stop. Come on, come on, 
Lopez trying to close the distance here against Jesus Martinez. They move back to the center of the ring. Oh, right hand grazing the chin on Lopez. Oh, Martinez connecting, but Lopez fighting back hard. Both men landed really good right hands. They are punching with one another. That's been the case throughout the fight. Less than a minute to go here in round three. Martinez looking up at the clock. That right of hand might have had an effect. Mm, good right hand again for Martinez. A lot of holding in this round. What does that tell you between two young fighters? <laughs> I mean, it, it could just because Lopez is very aggressive and Martinez is not physically strong enough to keep him off him. But also, he could have been affected by some of those right hands that he may be holding to uh, to catch his breath a little. Right hand that may graze the back of the head of Pantorita. Yeah, it seemed like a ricochet off the shoulder. Yeah. Final tag in round three. Another quality right shot from Jose Ooh. Lopez. And a left hand upstairs by Lopez. More good head movement from Pantorita. Excellent exchanges in round number three between these two 120-pounders. Martinez and Lopez right now. Coming up next, big stepper, Khalil Ko, trying to take a big step in 2023. It's one the Dodgers had, though. This is a New York kid. Trains in Brooklyn. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder what that's about. we got, we got to ask yeah. him when we see him next. we have to have a word with Khalil. <laughs> Khalil Ko will be taking on Jimmy Queter of Chicago. Six round match, light heavyweight Ko. Podium star as an amateur. Coming off a very productive 2022, led by trainer Eric Roman, trying to get going here in 2023 and continue this quality progress in his young pro career. Here, fourth and final round between Martinez and Lopez in our opening bout. Martinez in the black trunks. Oh. Lopez coming out swinging to start the final round. This has been a good scrap between these two young guys. Martinez is definitely showing some improvements, some new, new wrinkles to the game. Lopez, I mean, stern challenge, bringing it every round. Not a knockdown there. Oh. Back up, and another right hand blitzing Martinez. Big right hand again from Lopez as Martinez was coming in. Neither men known for their punching power. Only one knockout between the two of them. That happened in Martinez's last fight. Lopez looking for his first career KO. And you wonder if Martinez, as he eats a right uppercut from Lopez, is going to try and box around that right hand in the closing two minutes or so. Not easy right round for score, Justin. These guys are really going back and forth. Both are doing great jobs, but neither separating themselves from the other. Yeah, they, they, they each have spurts. Which is just basically just based on activity. It's like it's back and forth. Whoever's whoever's working is winning. Hey, you're coming away impressed from both fighters. There's not a large margin though right now. It should be interesting to see from how the judges score this. Remember in Texas, I remember this from Ammo Williams when we were la here last year. Texas judges, what do they look for? Who's controlling the pace? That weighs heavily on their scorecards. I mean, if, you, if you're talking about aggression, it's definitely coming from Lopez. He's trying to punch on the inside. Ooh, big overhand right. And there's been a lot of holding on the inside, mostly initiated by Martinez. Lopez overhand having, right again from Lopez. Lopez is having a good round. He's landed some really nice right hands. He finished strong in his last fight against oh. Rodriguez. That was a majority decision. He did just enough in that final round for the judges in that four-rounder. Is he doing enough in this four-rounder? Meets him with a left hook. This is Lopez. And Martinez is getting a little sloppy here. Lopez landing the quality shots at a higher frequency in the fourth round. It looks like the physical strength of Lopez is starting to show itself. You know, he's older. Martinez only being 18 years old. That man strength is starting to come is starting to become apparent. Ken Pantorita close off the final 30 seconds oh. with a step up here. 
Yeah, Lopez has had a very consistent round. Hasn't been the prettiest round, but it's been effective for Lopez. Good body shot there. Martinez working downstairs. But Lopez, self-made. Oh, may have closed the show in this four-rounder. Good scrap to open up before the bell. Yeah, very, very good scrap. I, I want to see both these guys again, honestly. Even, even, even Lopez. Jose Lopez did a great job in rounds two and four. Left no doubt in round four. Yeah, Maybe. round four I think was the most obvious round of someone who, you know, who was able to control. I think round one was pretty obvious for Martinez. Round four was pretty obvious for Lopez. It's really going to come down to how the judges saw those middle rounds two and three. I could easily see a draw. I was about to say that. So we'll see what happens. This is the third time that Jesus Martinez has fought at Tech Center, or Techport Arena. He's won his previous two, showed a good performance here against Lopez, but we await the judges' scores and the official decision. Martinez, Lopez impressing in the opening bout here on Before the Bell. Let's make it official with David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen, after four rounds here in San Antonio, we go to the judges' score totals, and they read as follows. Sergio Calles, 39-37, Lopez. Dave Moretti, 39-37, Martinez. Ellis Johnson scores this contest. 38-38, we have a split draw. So a split draw in our opening bout between Martinez and Lopez. Chris, no arguing there for, from me. I don't know about you, but a split draw, pretty appropriate. No, I, I had it a draw. I even said that. Just, just you know, the tempo of this fight, it being a four-rounder, it's very easy to see that fight being even. Both men had their moments. Uh, run it back and do it in six rounds. Let's see, <laughs> Let's see who's going to get the win. Nobody was really able to separate themselves in this fight. Did you take a look at some of the footage? From our first bout of the evening, Jose Lopez, Jesus Martinez at a catch weight of 120 pounds. Jesus Martinez, I think, knew that he was in for a fight, taking on one of his most talented opponents in Jose Lopez, and he controlled the tempo in round one. Yeah, he looked great in round number one. I mean, he had some really snappy left hooks. He was landing the right hands. He was tightening Lopez as he was being aggressive. There we see a nice body shot left hook combination as Lopez is trying to come in. But Lopez, man, he was he was aggressive. He kept coming on. He started finding a home for the overhand right as both men were coming in. Round three, more of the same back and forth action. Again, really hard to see who was going to separate themselves in this fight. Just not enough rounds. You know, both men look to be in, in pretty good shape. And the fourth round was their busiest round. The best round of the fight for Lopez, for sure, off the strength of those right hands that you just saw, which he was able to land pretty consistently in that round basically just being aggressive and Martinez not physically strong enough to keep him off him in that fourth round so I had Lopez taking that that last round I had Martinez taking the first round but then again two and three very very close round so I think this is a, a worthy draw sense of disappointment there from Pantorita when the judge's decision was ruled but a split draw between he and Jose Lopez Jose, uh, Jose Lopez 24 years of age now I guess falls to four, two, and two. Not what you want as a fighter, but for Jesus Martinez, now three, oh, and one. Like we said, 18 years of age. Kind of wants to be unleashed as a young pro, chipping at the bit. Decorated amateur career. What do you want to see him do next? 
Yeah, he's got to go back to the drawing board. He's got to, I think he's got to work on his, his man strength, really, his physicality, his conditioning. He seemed like he got a little bit gassed in the, in the last couple rounds. So I, 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 what he did at the beginning was fantastic. First round was awesome. Great, great footwork, good snappy punches. Got away from that a little bit as the rounds wore on. So I think conditioning is going to be really important. I think just working on his physical strength. Yeah, we saw a lot of impressive footwork as well from Martinez in that opening round. But what we saw in the first kind of waned throughout the fight just, just a little bit overall. Yep. Uh, he, he did a very nice job against Jose Lopez. I think the split draw well earned between these two fighters. Coming up next, it is Khalil Co and Jimmy Queter. And that's Queter, who you see on the scales, who found out about this fight this time last week in Chicago. Late notice for Jimmy Queter. No complaints there. He was already training for another fight. And there you see Khalil Co trying to make his mark at 175 pounds. Looking sharp on the scale. And after an impressive 2022, he is trying to start off 2023. Really pick off where he left off in his last fight in Cleveland on November 12th. What did you like about Khalil Coe's performance in 2022? Three matches and... I think we saw progress in each of them. Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and that's what we need. That's what we expect from him. There's a he's very highly touted. He has he has done some incredible work in the gyms. We just haven't seen it yet in the fights, and he's and he's inching towards reaching his potential, and he's showing that more and more. I'm, I'm looking for him to do that tonight to show the improvements and to show really what he's got because uh, the, the the kid is a deep bag, and we want to see it. Yeah, things have improved since he made a change to his training staff after a draw against Aaron Casper. We bring that up again because this was originally scheduled to be the rematch between Khalil Ko and Aaron Casper, and Ko was eager to erase any doubt that Casper was on his level. Casper fell out. He pulled out of the match due to an illness. Queter called upon, so it is Ko and Queter here in our second event on Before the Belt tonight. Let's get started and meet the fighters. Here's David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen from San Antonio, Texas, we are set to go with a special light heavyweight attraction. Set to make his ring walk, please welcome sweet Jimmy Queter. No fluff, no pop, no circumstance for sweet Jimmy Queter. 27 years of age, 6-1-1 one one out of Chicago. He is making a big step up in competition on late notice. Again, training for another match in Chicago when he received word just last week that there was this opportunity for him here once Aaron Casper pulled out. This is Queter's first ever pro fight outside of his hometown of Chicago. And he has shown power. All six of his pro wins have come via knockout. And now entering the arena, please welcome the undefeated Khalil, Big Step Co. Twenty-six-year-old Khalil Co. He's four zero oh, and one, and the Jersey City, New Jersey native. Playing to the crowd here with that San Antonio basketball jersey, but he is back in action after making quality progress in three fights last year. He's coming off a shutout victory on the judges' scorecards against Bradley Olmeda back in November on the Love Spark undercard. It was highlighted by a fifth-round knockdown. Co is, again, training to face Aaron Casper tonight in a rematch of their draw in late 2021. Casper pulled out less than 10 days ago, so Co. Dealing with Queter this evening in Texas. Ladies and gentlemen from the Boeing Center at Techport here in beautiful San Antonio, Texas, live on the zone, we are set to go with a special light heavyweight attraction. It's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing. We're sponsored by Bet Online, O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day, and stage front. Introducing your three judges scoring this contest from ringside. From Nevada, Lisa Jampa. From Texas, Ellis Johnson, and also from Texas, Jesse Reyes. And at the sound of the bell, your third man in the ring, from Texas, Rafael Ramos. 
And now, ladies and gentlemen, six rounds of boxing scheduled in the light heavyweight division. Introducing first, fighting under the red corner, wing the black trunks with the white trim. He scaled 174.8 pounds. His professional record, six victories, one defeat, one draw, and all six of his wins coming by way of knockout. He fights out of Chicago, Illinois. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing sweet Jimmy Queter. Queter. And his opponent across the ring fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the silver with black trim. He scaled 175.8 pounds. He is undefeated in his campaign as a professional with a record of four victories, no defeats. He has one draw with two wins coming by way of knockout. Fighting out of Jersey City, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing Khalil. Big step up, Co. Co. Oh. <clears throat> You receive the pre fine instruction, protect yourself and obey my command. Good luck. Give it the final word there to Co and Queter. Again, Jimmy Queter, 6 1 and 1, 6 wins, 6 KOs. Khalil Co, 4 0 oh, 1 with 2 knockouts. And he is looking to impress following a solid 2022 Co in the silver trunks with the black trim. and. Queter in the black trunks with the white trim. One thing that has stood out with Khalil Ko, not necessarily a slow starter in the sense that he doesn't throw punches, utilizes the double jab pretty well, but it, it seems like in the first half of fights, it takes him a while to sense where his opponent is at. That's what we saw in Cleveland in November. Yeah, it seems like he needs to analyze. He's, he's collecting data early on. There's a beautiful jab there from Ko, but uh, as the fight wears on, he usually figures his guy out figures out the range so not necessarily a slow starter but definitely a thinker early on yeah and an impressive finisher in the back end of that fight with Almeida and Co said that he felt he definitely could have been more aggressive in the early rounds there he had Almeida hurt but he didn't realize it that's part of a learning process yeah sometimes you're so close to the action it's hard to see and Queter falls back after an impressive right hand he's trying to fight off Co along the ropes you know, and you mentioned Queter has not fought outside of Chicago until tonight. He does have six wins by way of knockout. So it, it, even with limited competition, he's still knocked out all the guys that he beat. So you got to be careful. He does look heavy-handed and somewhat awkward. Ooh, oh, shot. thunderous right hand by Cone. What does Queter do? He steps back up. But he's now aware of the power from Khalil. That was a good left hook to the temple. Looked like it shook Queter down to his legs a stab cross from Co to the body yeah Queter looks very awkward out there I mean elbows wide wide stance looks strong though swinging hard shots so Co should be careful oh, oh he cracks him with the right hand Queter goes down in the first from well, the markings on Jimmy Queter's face dead center a lot of redness. It goes being smart. He's got a guy who's throwing wide punches. He's throwing short, straight shots down the middle. There's another right hand that rocks Queter. Can Co close it out in the opening round? Queter trying to fight him off. 40 seconds to go. Mm. Raises him with a right uppercut. Does Co? Khalil Co having his way with the oh. Chicagoland native here in round number one. Uh, Queter has no answer for that little pull straight right hand that Co has been throwing. I mean, just splitting the guard right down the middle. Perfect technique, especially for fighting a southpaw. Co ducks under. Just a few steps ahead in speed from Queter. Another right hand. Queter trying to punch back. Queter is landing some shots, though. Full display in round one from Co.
story of the first round was that shot right there, the straight right hand that Cozen throwing, splitting the guard of Queter, dropped him about midway through the first round. Beautiful shot, perfectly executed, pull right hand down the middle, catches Queter on the chin, puts him on the seat of his pants. The straight right from Co doing damage in the first round. Similar punch that knocked Bradley Omeda down in the fifth round of their fight back in November in Cleveland. You saw Co try to try to do it again. You don't want to go to the well too often when you got a good move like that. He needs to get away from it a little bit and then pull it back out when Queter's le uh, least expecting it. Chris, talking about that fight in Cleveland, Co, Co liked his performance so much that he actually got a portrait tattoo of himself from that fight on his back. That's, that's an interesting, interesting, interesting thing to do. We'll try and get a look at it at some point during this fight. Oh, another right hand. It stumbles. Queter. Nice head movement there from Co. While being aggressive, he's creeping in there trying to finish the show but still being active with his defense i like that being smart there's that shot again that pull right hand just missed queter moved his head just enough yeah queter definitely no defensive wizard in there just it kind of seems like a big strong tough guy oh nice up with the right uppercut Coe is making everything work at this point. Oh, there's a nice counter and a body shot. Smart. Dig the body. Got a guy who's a good power puncher. He's physically strong. Sap some of that power by hitting the body. Co controlling the distance, moving in and out at will. Another right hand from Khalil. Co needs to be careful and not just think about power shots. If you put some hand, some punches together, instead of throwing singles, I think he'll do more damage. Doubles up the right hand moments ago. Jimmy Queter, 27 years of age from Chicago, former hockey player, started boxing to stay in shape for hockey. There's maybe some of the, the sloppiness with that wide right from Co. Yeah, that's, and that, that makes sense that he was a hockey player. I, I can see that in his physicality, his, his, his body type, and kind of the way he throws punches. Coe setting up the right hand with the double jab. Queter, his coach, Peter George, he was asked, how can Queter try and break down a fighter that's so fundamentally skilled as Coe is here? He said, you go back to the basics. You, you stick to the jab. You don't try and reinvent the wheel. But we have not seen too many, if any, jabs from Jimmy Queter. I honestly don't think he has thrown a single jab. Coe, who came out flashing a beautiful jab in the first round, got away from it, got back to it. A little bit in this round, landing some nice shots. No oh, left hand from Queter. Nice. Reaches through. So Queter with a little bit of success here at the end of round two, but it's Co with the effective aggression in the second. Here we see Co. Coming in with some nice head movement, being aggressive but still being defensively active. There's a tongue, stuck his tongue out to Queter and then threw some shots, mostly missing. Co digging to the body there on the inside. See, Co's having more success now when he throws multiple shots rather than just the one big power shot. There you see Khalil Co's son, roughly a year old now. He did the fighter meeting with Khalil earlier this week, and his son was, was on his lap. His, his son wanted to participate fully <laughs> in the fighters meeting. Oh, he looked like he was paying attention to the fights yeah. just now. So He just started crawling a couple of days ago, so Khalil basically said, yeah, now we're, we're dealing with that now. Yeah. <laughs> a whole new thing once they get mobile. Start of the third round scheduled for six between Ko and Queter. Khalil Ko. Aiming to record his third early stoppage as a pro. Recorded the knockdown in round one. There's that sharp right hand from Ko. 
And it could be tough when you got a guy like Queter, who's a little bit awkward, a little bit strong. He's tough, obviously. He's taking some big shots. This is when you got to really show your class. Use the jab. Use your feints. Get those first moves out of the awkward guy. Put him in a bad position. Put him off balance, and then strike. Right hand to the body by Ko. Throwing his weight around and Queter around, but Jimmy Queter trying to take control of this match and not be bullied around by Ko. Doubling up the jab, coming back with the left hand. Nice jab there from Ko. Nice. Right hand counter. A master from Ko. Queter down for the second time tonight. It's another beautiful pull counter from Ko. From Ko. Again, just like I was saying, set some traps, have him be off balance, and that's exactly what happened. It was a right hand, caught Queter in the side of the head, put him down, flash knocked down. Didn't seem like he was really hurt, but when you got a guy who's off balance. Oh! But that could close the show, and it does. The fight waved off by Rafael Ramos and Khalil Cohn with the right hand, this time an uppercut. Victorious in his first match of 2023. Wow. That's a highlight reel knockout. His trainer, Eric Roman, liking what he sees as Ko closes it out. Impressive punch after impressive punch. Khalil Ko gets the fifth win of his young pro career. We saw it from the opening round, Chris, maybe just a matter of time after the right-hand damage that was displayed by Khalil Ko. It caught up to Queter. Oh, there was that first pull right-hand knockdown that was ha that happened earlier in the round. Perfect little sidestep move, makes Queter reach, and then bang! Huge right uppercut, timed perfectly. Again, I think Ko just found his range. We were talking about how he likes to analyze his opponent early on, find the range, find the timing, and that was exactly it right there. Pulled the trigger perfectly, landed an uppercut as Queter was, again, off balance, falling forward. I mean, really couldn't land a cleaner, more beautiful shot than that. Well, the timing looking terrific for Khalil Ko in that third round with a bunch of those impact shots as he takes it down. Queter still a little off balance near the ropes, but Let's go into the ring with David Diamante and make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Rafael Ramos calls a halt to this contest. He reaches the count of 10. The official time, 1 minute and 51 seconds of round number 3. Declaring your winner by knockout. He's still undefeated, Khalil. Big step up, Cole. A sharp showing for Khalil Ko in his first fight of the year. And he's put together consistent performances, Chris. I think it's, that's something that really stands out given where he was uh, a, a little over a year and a half ago. Yeah, I know. This is, this, is, this is what you want to see in a young fighter at this stage. He's getting better each and every time out. I, I talked about how he has a deep bag. I think he showed that tonight. We saw some things from him tonight that really shows you that what kind of level he's, he's at and where he could potentially be in the future. His trainer, Eric Roman, says that Khalil is a, is a five-tool fighter as we take a look at some of the fight footage here with Queter and Co. But Roman talked about Ko's speed, his power, his footwork, his defense, and his heart. This is an emerging fighter right now. He hasn't had to show the heart yet, you know, with the opposition that's been in front of him. But he's showing that he's got skills, he's got power, he's got hand speed. Today, I think he showed great timing. He showed great understanding of, of range and was able to take an awkward and strong guy and really break him up, break him down, take him apart piece by piece. There we see some some defense to go along with the, the massive offense that he was showing in round number one. And listen, that's not not Queter. He's a tough guy. He came to fight. There was no quit in him at all. He was just completely outclassed. Here we're going to see that pull right hand again from Ko. Drops Queter on the back. 
And then now the finishing shot, perfectly timed right uppercut. Boom, man, you could not paint a prettier punch than that one. Remember, you're talking about Queter with his hands being wide, and, I mean, they were as wide as could be right there. Yeah, Might as well warn of sign for Khalil Co. Yeah, it was It was all the, the shots down the middle, the straight right hands and the uppercut that was just splitting the guard. Like, yeah, Co saw the same thing we did. Queter had his elbows way out, and there was a lot of opportunities, a lot of holes to stick those power punches through, and, and, and Co found them. So Khalil Co improves to 5-0-1. and one. He picks up his third career KO. Just progression? That's what we should be seeing more. Do you think he could be going for another six-rounder here? Could he graduate to eight rounds? Uh, I mean, I, I could see going right to eight from here. I mean, he's he's. I think he's doing the work in the gym. He's getting in shape. I mean, he, he's getting the guys out of there, which is great. Uh, but more rounds is good, and he's got to step up in competition as well. What's impressive is what we were talking about at the very beginning of the fight. It, it takes Co maybe a little bit of time to sense where his opponent is at, what they can do, and then he goes on the attack. He saw it early on that Queter could potentially make enough mistakes where Co could come in and seize the opportunity, but that all goes into taking chances as a young fighter. That's what we saw from Co. Yeah, I mean, I think he got touched with a few shots early on when when, when Queter was throwing with him, and, and he got smarter. Co did. He actually adapted during the rounds. He's like, all right, I'm going to slow things down. I'm going to go back to my jab, and I'm going to let this guy run into my shots. And that's exactly what he did. He, he, he gave just enough length in the noose to hang himself, and and you know, Co ex you know, executed perfectly. You know, that right uppercut was a thing of beauty. So first two matches here are before the bell. We see a draw. We see an early stoppage. Third round KO by Khalil Co over. For Jimmy Queter. We have two more matches to come. Mark Castro still to come in action. He's up next against Ricardo Lopez. And then the main event here on Before the Bell, Israel Madrimov. The Dream back in action on Before the Bell. He will be taking on Rafael Igbakwe before the main card tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern on the zone, leading up to the main event between Bam Rodriguez and Christian Gonzalez. We talked about the main card earlier at the top, but we stopped short with uh, Ray Ford and Bessie Magdaleno. We talked about that, obviously, with the co-feature. And Jay Akmedalia back in action. He was last seen in this building uh, getting a victory over Ronnie Rios and retaining his title. He's making a fourth defense here tonight. I think a lot of people question the inactivity with MJ Akmedalia. Obviously, obviously came over in an injury with this one, but he has the skills to potentially be that guy against Stephen Fulton and, and Nio Inouye. That's yeah. what everyone's focused on. He's already thrown his hat into the mix talking about those guys. I'll, I'll want the winner. I mean, he would be deserving of it. He has been a phenomenal, fast-rising star in these lower weight divisions. And like we had said from the top, these little guys fight each other, which is great. So we can see these unification matchups. So, I mean, he's a major player in these divisions now. Doc Medalia getting set to make his fourth defense of his WBA and IBF Super Bantamweight titles later tonight against the former champ in Marlon Tapales. Little less than a month from now, in Guadalajara, Canelo Alvarez back in action against John Ryder. Here's a preview of Canelo Ryder later in this spring's schedule for Matchroom and DAZN coming at you in Canelo's hometown in Guadalajara. I've already put the text into Reynoso. Every time that Saul Canelo Alvarez fights, the world is watching. I think this is the perfect moment, perfect fight to bring this fight to Guadalajara. The timing is now and the timing is right. I truly believe I can come away victorious. The whole world will be watching. This is a fight that will be remembered in the history of Mexican boxing forever. Coming up on May the 6th, Mark Castro has had no problem going out there and getting his spots on Canelo undercards. He's been a, a frequent occupier of Canelo undercards, but here this evening in San Antonio, it's Mark Castro trying to go for his 10th win as a pro. He's 9-0 with six knockouts. He's coming up next year on Before the Bell against Ricardo Lopez, and Lopez stands as Castro's most experienced opponent to date, 16-6-3. He's 25 years of age, but he has had a wealth of experience as a pro fighter in Mexico. As we welcome you back inside the studio here on Before the Bell, along with Chris Algieri. I'm Justin Shackle. Castro Lopez coming up next. What are you looking to see as Mark Castro obviously developing very nicely, but 
Make it a step up here in 2023. This is the beginning, going up against a more experienced pro. Yeah, he's going in with a guy who's got 25 professional fights. I mean, that's a big deal. So, and he's and he's got a, a nice winning record. You know, he has, he has six losses, but 16 wins. I mean, that's something to scoff at. So th this is a legitimate step up for Mark Castro, who's under 10 fights. This is. I'm looking to see his progression and, and looking to see him do it against the best opponent to date. Earlier this week, we had the press conference. We had the weigh-in on Friday. And all throughout there, we heard whispers from Mark Castro. The big theme that he was preaching was a step up. 2023 is a year where he is stepping up. So when you take a look at his resume, what could be realistic in terms of stepping up? Yeah, I think fights like this are important. I think getting to the 10 round distance is important for the team. They've been, they've been talking about that. So being able to step up, this, this is the eighth, in the, an eighth round, eight rounder. I think they said they want this to be their last eight rounder, which I think I think making that milestone is a good plan for 2023. Get to that 10, 10 rounder, maybe even get to, to, to 10 rounds, uh, which is a good, I think it's very good for fighters to actually go the distance and get the rounds in in their young career so they can progress. But I think that as the competition gets stiffer, we're going to see more and more rounds at a mark. Yeah, we always hear young fighters, their trainers. Yeah, we want to we want to progress to uh, additional rounds of, of fighting, but you want to get through and go the distance in those rounds. That's yeah. the whole purpose. You want to have an opponent that can hang with your guy and get those full rounds in, go the distance. Catch weight at 133. This was the scene in San Antonio on the scales with Castro and Lopez. And this was a match that was discussed over the last year or so. They both went their separate ways in 2022, but here they are in the month of April in San Antonio on the scales with Castro and Lopez. And this was a match that was discussed over the last year or so. They both went their separate ways in 2022, but here they are in the month of April in San Antonio to kick off the 2023 campaign for Mark Castro. Again, catch weight at 133. Castro weighed in at 133 on the nose. Lopez just over 133 at 133.6. But Castro making his living in the 135-pound division. And something that Mark Castro noted in the face-off at the press conference, and we did see it there at the weigh-in. He noted, like, hey, do you see Ricardo Lopez? His face was flinching. He's scared. Is that is that accurate? Um, I mean, it, it's it, listen. Whatever you need to do to say to pump yourself up is it's great. But like, listen, some scared fighters fight great. So you, you got to be careful. It's not, I, I know a lot of fighters that, quote unquote, seem scared, but they perform well under those conditions. And you know, it's it's a it's a fight. So it's good to be a little nervous. We talked about that off air earlier. It's nice to have a little bit of nerves. It's good to have that chip on your shoulder and have that that edge. And it might just be that situation. Lopez is coming to win. He's not here to roll over. You want those good nerves. Shows you that you're uh, you're alive. You have a heartbeat here. You're primed and you're and you're switched on. Yeah. You know if you're not if you're not nervous, a lot of times you can be kind of switched off, and that's when you get a lot of lackluster performances. Well, Mark Castro, like we said, trying to improve to 10 and 0 with this fight. Big step up in 2023. There you saw his father, Tony Castro. He represents the new age of some young boxers in this sport. Over 900,000 followers on TikTok. He has close to a quarter million followers on Instagram. And he uses those platforms to gain awareness with boxing. It's terrific because there are a lot of eyes on him. He was talking about some of those goals for 2023. Stay undefeated, record some knockouts, but also get the experience and potentially at year's end compete and hopefully win a regional title, but all doing it while raising his brand, which he hopes could potentially bring a fight to his hometown of Fresno, California. Yeah, I mean, I, I like what he's done with his career thus far in terms of using the social media and, and, and building, quote unquote, his brand. And he's done a great job at it. He, has, he makes funny videos, he gets a lot of engagement, uh, and that's really important to stay in age. You gotta use all of your assets and everything around you in order to build what you're ultimately get going towards, which is being a world champion. And hey, listen, it helps get those extra shekels in your pocket when you've got a lot of followers and people who are checking you out. Yeah, I asked him how long does it take you to complete a TikTok video. He said, eh, it varies. He showed me one that took like over an hour to edit and post. Sorry, I don't have that kind of time here. But he said, hey, it pays off. Yeah, it okay. pays off 600,000 views. That's no, it, it, definitely, doing it definitely pays off. And like yeah. I said, this generation, I mean, we're, we're a little older than him. <laughs> so, it, yeah, taking that time to do those TikTok videos, not really our thing, but yeah, all the power to him. It's funny. People say oh, the attention span of young people isn't there. Our attention span to do the things that young people do yeah. isn't there. So we leave it to the pros like Mark Castro. He and Ricardo Lopez are ready to go. The third fight on before the bell, getting set to kick off.
Back to the ring we go with David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Boeing Center at Techport here in San Antonio, Texas, we're set to go with a special lightweight attraction. And now entering the arena, please welcome Ricardo Explosivo Lopez. Ricardo Lopez is 25 years of age. He's 16, 6, and 3. He's trying to avoid back-to-back -back defeats after dropping unanimous decision against Manuel James in December. This is his fourth fight in the United States. He was born and raised and still lives in Tijuana, Mexico, where he is the only male out of seven children. His father introduced him to boxing when he was 13. He turned pro at 18, and he kept it brief throughout fight week when asked what the path to an upset win over Mark Castro would look like. Lopez said, throw a lot of punches and look for the knockout. Sounds like a good plan. See if he can pull it off. And now entering the arena, please welcome the undefeated Mark Castro. See a lot of terrific images of Mark Castro, but we're waiting for the man himself to walk through here as he gets ready for his 10th pro fight. Again, he knows what he's doing. Waiting for the right cue. Yeah. And there he is, 23 years of age, again, 9 0, 6 knockouts, coming off a, a, a wide range display in his four fights last year. Everything from responding to his first knockdown to going the distance from recording one of the more viral knockouts when he competed on that Canelo Triple G undercard. He has uh, earned a unanimous decision over Michael Lopez in his last fight back in December. He said he wants this to be his final fight scheduled for eight rounds. And if all goes according to plan tonight, there is a chance you may see Mark Castro in the ring again in less than one month on the Canelo Ryder undercard on May the 6th. That's what Castro says is the goal. He really wants to fight Guadalajara. Chris, we'll, we'll get into how that may affect his approach with Ricardo Lopez after both men touch gloves and start this fight. Ladies and gentlemen from San Antonio, Texas, live on the zone, we are set to go with a special lightweight attraction. It's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing. We're sponsored by Bet Online, O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day, and Stage Front. Introducing your three judges scoring this contest from ringside. From Nevada, Lisa Jampa. From Texas, Ellis Johnson. And from Nevada, Dave Moretti. And at the sound of the bell, your third man in the ring from Texas, referee Mark Colloy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, eight rounds of boxing scheduled in the lightweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, he wears the black trunks with the red trim. He scaled 133.6 pounds. His professional record, 16 victories, 6 defeats. He has 3 draws with 11 wins coming by way of knockout. Representando Team Zona Norte, Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico. Domas y Caballeros, Ricardo Explosivo Lopez. Lopez and his opponent across the ring fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the gold trunks and scaled at ready 133 pounds. His professional record, a perfect one. Nine fights, nine victories, six of them coming by way of knockout. 
fighting out of Fresno, California. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the undefeated young prospect, Mark Castro. Castro. Okay, gentlemen, we've already gone over the rules in the dressing room. I want you to obey my commands at all times. Most importantly, protect yourself at all times. Guerreros, choquen wanted, buena suerte. Mark Calloway, the third man in the ring for this one, the third of four matches here on Before the Bell tonight. Mark Castro and Ricardo Lopez going out of eight rounds. At a catch weight, 133. Castro with some impressive trunks. Gold with his heritage draped along the side. His, his mother is Mexican. His father is from El Salvador. And he is a proud American from his hometown of Fresno in California. Lopez in the black trunks with the red trim. Castro has good lateral movement, but he is a combination puncher. He's at his best when he's letting his hands fly. And Lopez said that Castro throws a lot of punches, likes to stay busy with the hands. As there you see upstairs and downstairs, the combo from Castro, but he also takes punches, and that's what he's bringing in with him and his approach tonight against Mark Castro. Yeah, we spoke about Castro, how he had to deal with getting up off the floor a couple fights ago when he fought Madera. That was the most impressive win for me, for Mark Castro's career, because he had to adjust, and he did it beautifully. He got up, he started jabbing, he got aggressive with the jab and the movement, and he'd never really shown that before. I knew he had it because of his amateur pedigree, but he never had to do it. And that fight, he had to do it. He had to get himself off, off, off the campus and box to a decision win and look phenomenal doing it. Yeah, that's where he saw a young pro grow up in about an 18 minute period because yep. it was a six round fight got knocked down his mindset was okay lose the round go lose the round don't try and overexert yourself and try and make up for it and that's what he did he outboxed Madero the rest of the way good right hand there from Lopez catches Castro as he's pulling out left hand from Lopez so we talked about Castro wanting to be on that Canelo card on May 6th, less than a month from now, how could that affect his approach into this fight tonight? Well, hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully it doesn't affect the way that he fights. He's got a man in front of him who's, he, who's here to win. So he's got to take this fight very seriously. One foot in front of the other. You can never think past any opponent. And Ricardo Lopez is definitely one of those guys. So I, I would hope it wouldn't have an effect on how he would fight or even be in the back of his mind right now. Canelo, or Castro has fought on a handful of Canelo undercards. One thing about Mark, he's a very thoughtful young man. He he thinks a lot about his career, like you mentioned, his brand. You thinking about Canelo? Uh, he's a, he's a very cerebral young guy. Takes his sport very seriously from top to bottom. Oh, big right hand from Lopez. Right hand return to the body from Castro. Lopez trying to bounce back from a unanimous decision defeat. I won over eight rounds in December. Dealing with one of these, you need the free fix finder service from AutoZone. It checks these warning lights to email you a detailed report. It's the most complete free warning light report backed by technician verified fixes. We see Ricardo Lopez and his trainer, Fernando Fernandez. As we take a look at the dream, getting ready, Israel Madrimov. 8-0-1, featured in our main event here on Before the Bell. He will be taking on Rafael Igbakwe from nearby Houston. Here it's round two between Castro and Lopez. Scheduled for eight. Castro hoping it is the final eight-round scheduled fight of his career looking to move up to 10 rounders and he's looking to remain undefeated and approved to 10 and 0 here 
see the Tijuana on the back of Lopez's trunks. Anyone who knows anything about boxing knows that everybody in Tijuana is tough and everybody can box. Could smother exchange. All of Lopez's 22 other bouts as a pro have taken place in Mexico, all exclusively in Tijuana. Ooh, a right uppercut lands from Castro. Beautiful stuff from Mark. Good Quality combo. Yep. Another right uppercut, highlighting a combination from Mark Castro. You know, I, I like that Mark's being smart here. He's not fighting on the inside, just going tip tat. He's using that left hand, th mixing combinations, going to the body, and staying long. He's got the height and reach advantage. Might as well, might as well use it. Castro has a two-inch uh, height advantage here over Lopez. Comes up empty with that left hand. It looks even more than two inches because Lopez fights so hunched over. That's why that uppercut was so effective. He's heavy over that front foot. That uppercut would be a, a wise weapon for Mark Castro to utilize. Nice jabs, though, from Castro. Castro trying to work his way inside with the jab. Good body dig there by Lopez. That's smart because Castro is actually using a lot of energy right now. He's moving quite a bit. He's throwing combinations. And Lopez is very saying very composed, very within himself, as you would expect from such an experienced fighter. Jab sneaks through from Lopez. Yeah, he's, he's utilizing that hook as Mark is moving to it towards it. It's very smart. Throwing the punch to where Mark is going, not to where he is. So right now, Lopez has the timing down in the second round with Castro. If you could add up those punches, could make for an impressive round for Lopez. And 25 seconds to go here. But Castro dictating the pace, but like you said, moving around a lot here in the early going. A lot of lateral movement, and lateral movement tires you out. A lot of people don't understand that. Lopez caught Castro coming up with the left hook. Yeah, Mark got a little too tall there on the outside. Perhaps not enough to win the round, but Ricardo Lopez showing us something in the second. Yeah, definitely, it's definitely starting to assert himself and what he wants to do. He didn't do much in the first round, really got outworked. But in that round, he, was, he got a little bit closer, was able to land some shots. And I think that experience is starting to show for Lopez. There's that beautiful combination we saw some Castro. It was an uppercut from the outside, followed by a left hook and then a body shot. And then back to the jab. Beautiful stuff. Nice variation of punches. And here we see the double left hook from Lopez, which landed several times in that round. See Mark Castro being given a swig of water from his father and trainer, Tony Castro. Tony said earlier this week, and something that you alluded to as you see Castro's family, they want to be smart in this fight. They don't want to look reckless. Is that times you see that from a young fighter? And we did that, we did see that from Castro. We've seen it from Castro, yeah. exactly. And I, and I like what he's utilizing here. He's using, using his movement, using his height, his reach. He's tall for the weight class, so, so why not? I mean, if, as the competition gets better and guys can really punch, it's going to be good for him to stay long. Use his boxing skills. Good Mark, body shot. And Mark Castro coming up with the overhand right, trying to impress in his third straight eight-round fight. And one thing about Castro, he's not one of those twitchy, quick fighters. His, com his, his, his speed comes from his combinations. He lets his punches go pretty fluidly, and he's able to land lots of punches that way. But he's not like a oof, off the fresh off the front foot fast fighter. Lopez responds with a right hand. Oh, another right hand from Ricardo Lopez. And Lopez is doing something very tricky right now. He's using punches to move Castro into the next punch. So he throws that left hook to push him into the right hand, landing that right hand very clean. Lopez was quick to highlight his left hook in the fighter meeting, but it's the right hand doing the damage. There's a left hook from Ricardo Lopez. But mixed well with the timing, the right hand's finding a home here on Castro as he digs away at the body of Lopez. 
good work there from Castro. Upstairs, downstairs. See, we had mentioned from the top, he's a combination puncher. He's at his best when he's letting his hands go. Castro moving away out of those punches. You mentioned the left hook of Lopez. I would say you'd be hard pressed to find a, a Mexican from Tijuana who doesn't have a good left hook. <laughs> Two punch combo from Castro. He was as brief in his textbook with his answers as you could hear from a fighter. Like I said, right out of the gate. Throw a lot of punches, look for the knockout. That's my game plan. Okay. Okay. Good game plan. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get there? <laughs> he's not throwing a lot of punches right now. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that's really actually what's hurting Lopez right now. He's just waiting in. He's getting hit from the outside as he's trying to close the gap. But Mark is just too sharp, too busy. Castro meets him with the left hand. Quality shots to the body and snaps the head back with the jab. Hey, when Castro stays low like this, he's actually got pretty good upper body rhythm and head movement. It's hard to hit. It's when he pulls out straight is when he gets tagged from time to time. Nice body shot there from Castro. Combo left hook to the body from Castro. Castro's a, a very underrated body puncher. Punches well with both hands and is consistent. Hands flowing from Mark Castro for through three. Here we see some good work from Mark Castro. There we saw that left hook from Lopez. There was that right hand we spoke about early in the round. Beautiful 3-2 combination, but after that, it was really all Castro with letting those hands go, throwing combinations, and sweeping the rest of the round. Got hit with some big shots early, but took over as the round wore on. You see at the bottom of the screen, his face covered right now, but behind Fernando Fernandez in Ricardo Lopez's corner is our, our friend Angel Fierro. Fierro knocked out Eduardo Estela back on March the 4th in Mexico. He proved to 21-1-2. Uh, he tries to make his mark at 135 pounds. Fierro work in the corner here. He said he's here strictly for motivational support, so not too much advice giving from Fierro to Lopez in the corner, but maybe not. Another strong Mexican fighter as we begin round four here in San Antonio. Castro and Lopez scheduled for eight. Looks like Castro thinks that he found something with the body. Castro moving nicely, scrapes Lopez with an uppercut. Now has him on the ropes with that right hand. And another one. Lopez is not taking these punches too well right now. Another left hook. That one got through. Lopez seemingly hitting a wall here in the fourth round. Yeah, Castro's really pouring it on. You know, before the round ended in that last round, round number three, I spoke about the underrated body punching of, of Castro. And it looks like a lot of that water that he put in the basement early on is starting to pay off. Oh, big right hand upstairs. Snap Lopez's head back with the right hand. Lo Castro changing the levels, coming back up with an uppercut, and again, keeping the hands flowing, moving around. Castro seizing control of this scheduled eight-rounder here in the fourth. Yeah, this has been best round of the fight for Castro. He's landed some big shots. And really, I mean, it, it's the movement of Mark Castro that's that's really giving Lopez so much trouble. He, he just can't find a target. It's a common denominator for most of Mark Castro's opponents thus far. Castro boxing well, but still making it exciting and throwing combinations, landing big shots. Castro peppering Lopez with the jab. Lopez able to respond with the left hand.
Castro recognize him, recognizing a, a durable Mexican fighters in front of him, has no problem standing toe to toe. And it's a matter of how Castro can respond as he looks for his 10th pro win. Good chopping left hook there from Lopez. Partially blocked by Castro, but some got through. We spoke quite a bit about the experience of Lopez going into this fight and how it's a step up. We didn't mention much about his power. He has 11 KOs and 16 wins, which uh, is nothing to scoff at. And he does look like he's a physically strong guy. But Castro, the shots that he has taken, he's taken them well. The power right from Lopez. Castro responds quickly. Jab in the body work is really frustrating Lopez at this point. Nice shots there from Castro. Good overhand right lands as Castro pulls out. Last few sequences, even from the end of round four, they're carrying over here with in, ter in terms of some accurate counters from Ricardo Lopez. Again, there, punching with Castro. Mark knows at this moment, seems like he knows exactly what to do when he gets himself in that position oh, left hand on a moving in Lopez and another chip left hand lands by Ricardo Lopez what does Castro do lets the hands go even faster yeah it's, it's the big single shots from from Lopez and, and the, the fast hands and combinations from Castro Lopez perhaps feeling himself a little bit after connecting on those several punches, trying to establish or reestablish some type of rhythm here against Castro. Yeah, rounds three and four were pretty tough for, for Ricardo Lopez, but he landed some big shots at the end of round four and started out round five with some big shots, so giving him some confidence to move forward and be more in this fight. And Castro knowing exactly where he is Ooh. in the geography, overhand right by Lopez. I don't think, you know, Lopez is going to be able to get anywhere with the singular shots, Chris. Yeah, no, I was, I was actually just going to say, I mean, the, the output and work rate of Castro is really telling the story of this fight. Lopez lands big shots here and there. Doesn't put much together with them, though. This fight might get interesting, though, if Lopez keeps putting on the pressure like he is and keeps landing these shots. Lopez has been accurate. Oh, oh snapped the head back. Lopez eats a big right hand by Castro. And Mark Castro letting his hands go here at the end of round five. Left hand counter by Lopez. But again, it seems like whenever... Lopez is able to tag Castro. Mark Castro gets stronger. He gets faster with the combos. Yeah, Castro has a fighter mentality. He's like, you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. I'm going to hit you more. Good to see that in a young fighter. You, you want to have that mentality. 
There's that big left hook, and then he, he, again, he tries to cut Mark off as he's moving, which is a good tactic against a guy who's got good lateral movement like Castro does. There we see a big overhand right. Probably one of the better rounds that Ricardo Lopez has had tonight on the strength of those couple big power punches that he landed with both the left and the right. Mark's father, Tony, from El Salvador. Mark went to El Salvador during the World Cup. First time that he visited his father's homeland. He was able to meet El Famoso, Carlos Hernandez, first world champ from El Salvador. Start a round six between Castro and Lopez here in San Antonio. One more to go on before the bell, before the main card starting at 8 p.m., all leading up to Rodriguez Gonzalez in the main event tonight for the vacant WBO World Flyweight Championship. A couple of really nice body shots there from Mark Castro a moment ago. Been stepping out and countering really good first 30 seconds of this round. Lopez walking into a counter moments ago. He had said a couple of those big shots had kind of resurged Ricardo Lopez, and you're seeing him be more aggressive again, but it's giving opportunities for Castro to counter on the way out. Ooh, oh, right hand connect from Castro, a big one. And another moments later. We had mentioned how much energy that Castro has been putting out there since the beginning of the first round. But that's the one thing about Castro. He's in phenomenal shape. He's always he always looks like he's redlining it, but he keeps he keeps the pace. He's confident he can sustain that type of footwork, that type of foot movement throughout the fight. Go the distance with these eight rounders. And still throwing big shots. Yeah. Good right hand down the middle from Lopez again. Castro comes back upstairs, a left hook to the head. Yeah, it's, it's just really the work rate of Castro is overwhelming for Lopez. Mark Castro trying to remain undefeated and improve to 10 and 0 here in San Antonio. The fluidity of Mark Castro's movement being showcased throughout the first six rounds here. Yeah, we, kept, we kept mentioning the, the game plan of, of Ricardo Lopez, and it's actually a good game plan, but he's not using, he's not he's not doing it. He, he meant to throw a lot of punches and get the stoppage. He has not thrown that many punches. He has success when he does, just like right there when he landed a left hook with Mark, but he's just not punching enough. It's this grip and rip mentality for Lopez, but the frequency is not there for the Mexican. You know, it's one of those situations where Lopez is working so hard to get on the inside to get into punching range that by the time he gets there, he just doesn't punch. He's handcuffed. He's looking at the fact that he's there without actually capitalizing on Oh, big left hook to the body. That followed a right hand by Castro. Again, the combinations ever present. That's a slip up by Mark Castro. As the final seconds tick away here in this round, Mark Castro with the footwork and the combos, they continue here in San Antonio. Castro had a good round, ripping shots upstairs and downstairs, trying to break down Lopez. But Lopez always in there, always dangerous, sneaks in that left hook to the chin. There's that beautiful body shot right to the center of the mass, center mass of Ricardo Lopez. He took that well, though. Final two rounds, if you're Tony Castro, what are you telling your son? Stick to, stick to the jab, use your movement, stop and fire. Really keep doing what you're doing. I think he's just got a guy in front of him who's very durable. A tough Mexican from Tijuana, go figure. You know, it's, it's, it's what the guy's got in front of him, but he needs to be careful when he pulls out straight. He needs to keep that right hand up because that left hook is coming closer and closer. Lopez with the experience. He knows how to survive in the ring. As we begin round number seven, scheduled for eight between Mark Castro and Lopez.
Ricardo Lopez in the black trunks with the red. Mark Castro, the gold trunks with the flags from El Salvador, Mexico, and the U.S. Castro stepping on the gas. Start round seven. Oof. A little more thump to the punches for Mark Castro. Yeah, he's standing his ground more, too. And Ricardo Lopez Ooh, trying to answer nice. back. There's a double combo from Ricardo Lopez. Big shots from Lopez. Castro reversing the table here, though. Lopez slowing down a bit, not moving his hands. And Castro finding the target. Nice punch selection for Castro. You don't have to worry about... Oh. A fighter's wrong combos when you're talking about Mark Castro. You don't have to worry about oh. a fighter's wrong combos when you're talking about Mark Castro. Everything comes oh. punches. Another left hand turning the chin of Lopez. These punches are arriving fast and hard for Mark Castro in the seventh. And this is what I mean about Mark Castro, man. It seems like he's redlining. It seems like he's going to get tired, and then he does this. Like he's just—he's oh, always got another gear. Oop, slip there. No break. Lopez takes that opportunity to throw a left hand, but he has slowed down con uh, considerably here in the seventh. Yeah, I mean, taking some damage from Castro. Mark was very smart in that he put in some really hard, stiff body shots to Lopez to make sure that even if he is a little punched out, because he threw a ton of punches, that Lopez was also tired. Good exchange. Near the ropes between Castro and Lopez. Now they move back to the center. Oh, big and shot. Lopez getting tagged. Big time left hand from Castro. Lopez getting up after leaning on the ropes. And holding He's on dangerously trying to survive. close. He looked like he was going to go down there. Castro inflicting punishment here in round seven. Now the hands of Lopez drop. Lopez has been taking a ton of punishment this round. Oh. Incredible fitness displayed by Mark Castro in that round. We mentioned how hard he was working all night long, and then to close the show with just, I mean, combination after combination that way against a very, very tough guy. Mark Castro putting on a cardio clinic in San Antonio against the durable Mexican fighter in Ricardo Lopez, but he gets him out in the seventh round. Now to business. The proper hat has to be applied here. <laughs> Let's take another look. I mean, we talked about it all night long. It was, it was the combination volume punching of Mark Castro. That was the difference. I mean, and what he put on in that seventh round after a, 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 a fight where he was expending a tremendous amount of energy on his movement, his combination punching, very, very impressive. Love to see young fighters in that kind of shape. And you know he's doing the work in the gym because he shows up on fight night and, and it puts on a, a performance like that. Awesome stuff. Mark Castro all smiles after that early stoppage win. Let's make it all official in the middle of the ring with David Diamante. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Mark Colloy calls a halt to this contest. The official time of the stoppage, two minutes, 22 seconds of round number seven. Your winner by TKO, he's still undefeated, Mark Castro. Mark Castro now 10 and 0 with seven knockouts as he picks up right where he left off in four matches in 2022. And you get a bit of everything here. You nearly go the distance. You pick up seven quality rounds again against a very durable fighter out of Tijuana, Mexico, a tough Ricardo Lopez. But when you step on that gas pedal, you kind of turn on that fourth burner, so to speak. Maybe Tony Castro said, hey, let's go. Let's go for the stoppage to start the seventh round. Castro hit another gear. Listen, he, he knows how to close the show. That's for sure. The kid is a showman. We talked about his TikTok videos. He closed the show here. He went he went after it. I think the kid must have a third lung, the way that he was throwing <laughs> those punches in that seventh round. Very impressive stuff. Excellent work. Excellent finish.
against a very, very tough Ricardo Lopez. Mark Castro, 23 years of age. He turns 24 in August. And not only tough, but Ricardo Lopez was, he had some game. He was he was using those hooks to, to, to cut off Mark, setting up good shots, setting traps. He was just completely overwhelmed by, by the combination punching and the, the youth and vitality of, of Castro. Mark Castro claimed 2023 is a step up year in his young career. Step one was picking up his 10th pro win. And he does it in impressive style as we take a look at some of the highlights from round number one all the way through the stoppage in the seventh. Looking beautiful, Mark Castro here. He was moving very well, had great lateral movement side to side. Some big shots did get through for Lopez, putting up a stiff challenge. Like I said, not just a tough guy, but talented as well, setting traps. But Mark, his ability to counter punch, throw combinations, and basically seem like having a never ending gas tank, was able to get ahead of Lopez, take control. And then as the fight wore on, it was more, you know, it's back and forth. There we see a big shot from Ricardo Lopez. Like you said, this guy was no stiff, came to win, felt he was going to win. Mark just had too much game. There we see a big right hand over and over again. It was just Castro's lateral movement and combination punching. That was the difference round after round. There we see another big shot. Single shots here and there for, for Lopez. But for the most part, Castro put on a great performance. And eventually closing the show, coming up in round number seven, there we see the body work. Again, underrated body puncher is Mark Castro. And a lot of what we saw late in the fight, I believe, was done early in the fight from the body work that was consistently used, utilized throughout from round number one. And then the seventh round, Mark Castro hits another gear, lets his punches go. No sign of fatigue, absolute incredible conditioning. Cardio for days is Mark Castro and just completely overwhelms Lopez and beats him into submission in round number seven. Excellent, excellent performance from Mark Castro. High hopes for, for him, for sure. He proves to 10-0, picks up his seventh KO. As Ricardo Lopez falls to 16-7-3. Castro completes uh, a first step here in 2023 as we're joined by match with chairman Eddie Hearn. Mark said throughout the week, this is a step up year for him. We call guys like Mark Castro, Khalil Co prospects, I think they're aching to shed that title here and they're putting on some good performance. Yeah, I think a lot of the, the young guys that we signed who were standout amateurs like Mark Castro are starting to develop now into fights deeper in the card. Tonight was a before the bell for Mark, but if you look at guys like Raymond Ford, massive step up for him tonight. Diego Pacheco is now becoming a bit of a star. Ammo Williams just boxed at the O2 last week. They're, they're, these guys, it's getting serious for them now. Everyone's at different stages. Khalil Coe's still a little bit back, but I like what I saw from Mark Castro tonight. And I like the way he just flicked the switch in that round. You know, boxed a little bit off the back foot for a lot, just kept kept pecking away, pecking away, and then all of a sudden decided to come out on the front foot and, and step to Lopez and stopped him. And I think that's important because that's what people like to see. People remember that, you know? Yeah, he increased the speed in that seventh round, picks up the win. Seventh knockout here as we're joined by Eddie Hearn. We mentioned Khalil, what would you like about his performance? I think Khalil's just got to believe in himself a little bit more, you know? I mean, he punches very hard. It was an awkward opponent tonight because it was a late replacement. It was someone that was very game and quite clumsy. So he was always looking just to step back and, and land that shot. And actually, it's the early two knockdowns came from exactly that. The uppercut was a beautiful shot. And again, that's what I'm talking about, show real knockouts. You know, when you're on before the bell, obviously you haven't got the eyes of the main card, so you need to do something spectacular that virally resonates around the world, world with fight fans. If you look at the numbers from that knockout, everybody's going to watch it. So that's what you need to do. Any young fighter needs to understand you have to entertain, especially at this level. You can afford to take a few more chances than you can as things get a bit more serious. And, and you know, truck coaches don't really like that sometimes when you talk to them. You say, I want to see more. I want to see more aggression. It's like, be quiet, you. You know, we're, we're doing our thing. But I'm just telling you, keeping it real. That's what people want to see. And that's what's going to make people put bums on seats and tune in to watch these young stars. Yeah, absolutely. These young fighters, they need to understand that it's about putting butts in seats to get yeah. people excited. Mark Castro does a great job with that. He does all the out-of-the-ring stuff. I think Khalil Coe is starting to get there, too. Understand that, like you said, that's a highlight reel knockout. That's yeah. going on his, on his resume forever. Mm -hmm. So, beautiful stuff. I like what I saw from Coe in terms of his ability. Like you said, awkward opponent, strong guy, 
but he showed his class and he let that as the fight went on he analyzed the data figured it out and pulled the trigger and i think a lot of those younger guys with great amateur resumes who have boxed at high levels already you're going to see them look better against better opposition i think ray ford is a good example of that it seems that as he's stepping up actually and, and i'm seeing a lot of, of amateur fighters who are actually developing a lot of power that haven't been punchers in the amateurs but are sharp fast punchers and as they step up against aggressive opposition i think joe Caldine is a great example someone that's never looked to have loads of power in his career against people that are coming to survive all of a sudden you know we saw against the gower I, mean, I think we'll see it against rakimov as well in a couple of weeks he punches really sharp and hard and fast and that's like ray ford i wouldn't be surprised if ray ford got a stoppage tonight. i think it'd be a massive statement but he's he's just just big knockout last time and he's never looked like a puncher but I think the way that he punches and the sharpness of his punches against better opposition, I think you're going to see these guys force more stoppages. Let's talk about Ray Ford and Jesse Magdaleno tonight. If, if Ray Ford comes out victorious and he does it in an impressive fashion, how close is he to the things that he has openly talked about? A crack at a world title. I mean, really, you know, he sits at number three with the WBA. If you beat Jesse Magdaleno, you know, you're arguably got the resume to fight for a world title. I mean, I love what I see from Ray. He came into the office in New York like five years ago he, he couldn't look anyone in the eye and he was a young kid but he had a lot of skill and now he's actually developing his man strength you see him in the gym you know iron sharpens iron with Keyshawn and Shakur and he's got that little bit of swag about him now that belief about him you know I think belief is such a key thing I look at fighters I know it's a bit random but like Sonny Edwards and people like that right they just don't think they can get beat you know and I know that that's a danger but actually confidence wise there is no doubt in Ray Ford's mind tonight that he beats Jesse Magdaleno. And I've just got a feeling that he might be a special fighter. But come through Magdaleno, you know, he already wants the winner of Lee Wood against Maurizio Lara too. He wants Josh Warrington. He wants all, uh, Ray Vargas, all these guys. And you might actually see Ray, Ray Ford steam through the division and land a shot. And I'm excited for him tonight, but very nervous. Because Magdaleno, on the other hand, approached us and said, I just want an opportunity to get back to win a world championship. And he's told me this week, oh, 100, like, this, I can't believe Ray Ford's taking this fight. This is an easy fight for me. And he's a very accomplished, experienced fighter who can punch as well. It's a brilliant fight. We get to more of the main card. We just saw Edgar Berlanka yes. sign some autographs here. So Edgar in the house tonight. We have an announcement coming up with Edgar. Yeah, we will. Um, Edgar Berlanka. I was going to bring him up here, but he gets a bit excited. So uh, we're going to announce Edgar's June fight later on the broadcast. Um, I've got such a big mouth, I'm going to stop there because I'll end up just telling you the whole thing. So, great to see him. You know, he's a big attraction and we, we need a statement from him in June. You know, everybody talks about, you know, potential fight with Canelo Alvarez in 2024. There's a long way to go. He needs to prove and he, he's in with a former world title challenger, a guy who's around the top 15 in the world, uh, an accomplished fighter in June, and then come through that in style. And then we want to see a bigger step up against a top 10 guy you know, a, a big name, and then we can start talking about world title shots and Canelo Alvarez, because that's a big fight. You know, if Edgar Belanga can beat two or three credible guys, all of a sudden, him against Canelo, Mexico, Puerto Rico, it's a big fight, especially with the, the personality and support of Edgar Belanga, but a long way to go, and he's been out of the, year for, out of the ring for a year, Edgar Belanga, so, you know, good to see him back, and it'll be a big show in June. All right. Main cards coming up, two world title fights at two exciting weight divisions. Chris and I were talking about it at the top. It's it's nice to see we're able to see these type of fights on the same card. It, it brings up a loaded card, but it's also difficult to stay in the moment with these two weight divisions. You always are, are looking ahead here because the possibilities to unify, to become undisputed are there. Let's start with MJ Akhmedalia. How real is it where the winner here could face the winner oh, honestly, tonight like, in Illinois? The one of the great things about the smaller divisions is they don't necessarily get the attention you know you're not really dealing with you know multiple agents and managers and lawyers they just gen generally and genuinely want the biggest fights out there and mj just wants to be undisputed inoue just wants to be undisputed i think fulton the same so inoue fights fulton a hundred percent the winner of this fight tonight fights the winner of that fight for undisputed it's not even like and a deal will be reached and it will be done like that you know, and, and that's a tough fight. 
So Pilez is here to fight. He looks in tremendous shape. Sean Gibbons and his crew are here. They really fancy the job against MJ, who's coming off that terrible hand injury, you know, and coming back back to the scene of, of his last fight here as well. And, you know, that's a very tough fight for Akmadalia, but it'll be a war in there tonight. And I think the winner is guaranteed a shot at a new A. Fulton winner. Yeah, Justin and I spoke at the top of the show about how these, these lighter weights, it's so much easier to make the fights. Yeah. You see that they all want to fight each other. Right. They all want those opportunities. It's not like we're plagued with the, the higher weight. But class. they've never been spoiled. Right. You know, to a level where you're not going to get hundreds of thousands or, or millions of dollars for a tune-up. Right. You know, if you want to be a main event in the super bantamweight, in the super flyweight, the flyweight division, you have to be in a good fight. You have to be in a unification. You have to be trying to become a two-time world champion. And then when you look at the flyweight division, I think it's just it's so exciting because you've got Jesse Rodriguez, who's just desperate to unify. We've signed Sonny Edwards, desperate to unify. Julio Cesar Martinez fights in Guadalajara. So what we want to do is if Bam comes through tonight, it's Bam against Sonny Edwards. It's Julio Cesar Martinez against Delakian, maybe even on the same card. The winners fight the winners, and by the end of the year, we've got one champion. That's awesome. And that, that's really what we want in boxing, but it's so difficult to get it in the bigger weight divisions, you know. And that's one thing we love about female boxing as well. That all the champions are fighting each other, and you can consolidate a division. You can have one standout champion, the face of that division. And you can do that in the lower weights quite quickly. So I think if Bam wins tonight, straight into the Sonny Edwards fight, I think it's such a good fight, you know, and uh, so many great fights. Made. And you know in those weight classes as well, the fights are all action. Yeah. They never disappoint. You mentioned the women. Big women's fight coming up May the 20th in Ireland is Katie Taylor and Chantel Cameron get going here and we are very much looking forward to that one here is a quick preview of what to expect on May the 20th in Ireland but that that was on American soil it's only right to run it back again don't you think don't you think the rematch between Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano is officially uh, as the weeks have unfolded she's just not going to be ready Katie Taylor not fighting and that fight card not happening we have a problem Katie Taylor on her social media it's coming from Katie so there's no excuses can be made now and I always said that when Chantelle Cameron racked up the bell she would be the front runner undisputed champion versus undisputed champion both undisputed both undefeated no growing up Katie's like no 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 it's all dance at 140 that is a tougher fight than Amanda Serrano for Katie Taylor. I love it. Sensation. For the first time in a four-bell era, two reigning undisputed champions will face off against each other. The Queen of Ireland. She's coming home. That one coming at you on May the 20th. There you see Rafael Igbakwe, who is in our main event tonight. Hello, Chris Algieri. I'm Justin Shackle. We're joined by Eddie Hearn. Eddie. Chris and I, we're really thankful, but we're also scratching our head a little bit. How does a fighter the caliber of Israel Madrimov land up before the bell? You know, um, what he does is he needs activity, and we've got a fight schedule that's packed, and all of a sudden, you know, he has an opportunity to have a quick fight, and the world number one is about to fight on before the bell. Um, it's, it's an interesting situation for Madrimov. Michael Soro, he fought twice. Once was a no contest or, you know, a disputed stoppage. The next one was a technical decision. So his team just came on to us and said, look, he needs to fight. Make it happen. And we did that straight away here. Um, Soro actually fights Kurbanov coming up in May. And if Kurbanov wins that fight, we can just get rid of Michel Soro and put Madrimov straight in. Um, and there's big, big fights out there for him. You know, uh, I think he's ready. He's actually been looking for a world title fight since his professional debut. Um, so, you know, it's a... So it's a tick over for him tonight. Sometimes these fights are quite dangerous, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to look average right. in these kind of fights. You need yep. to go out there, and sometimes with not a lot on the line, you can do that. But I think Madrimov's got the style to excite us tonight. As we take a look at both fighters on the scales, I wonder, is Madrimov and Soro a third fight there? Is that something that Madrimov wants? Has he confessed that to you? No. Okay. No, I mean, you know, I think... <laughs> I, 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 we, we, we did that fight in Uzbekistan. Then I paid for that fight in London, and then I was like, I'm not paying for that <laughs> fight again. You know, um, it's definitely not fate to see those two back in the ring. So I think that tonight we want a good performance from Israel. Hopefully, sorry, Michelle Soro, hopefully he can get beat by Kurbanov, <laughs> and the WBA can just order that that fight straight away. Yes, you we, know, want the, uh, we want the forces of nature to bring Madrimov away from Soro here. So he's fighting here tonight in San Antonio, the main event uh, before the bell. What else are you looking forward to tonight? For me, you know, one of the opening fights, uh, Thomas Matisse against the Cessna. 
you know, what I like about this, going back to what I said earlier about these fighters that haven't been spoilt with opportunities. So they're so excited. I see them walking around the hotel just pumped. You know, and you look at Matisse, who had a fight of the year contender last yeah. time uh, in Cleveland. All of a sudden, he's fighting Cezna, who is, what, 17-0, undefeated Mexican fighter. And we keep unearthing these Mexican stars, Maurizio Lara, Eduardo Nunes, and there's so many of them. So Cezna's looking at tonight and saying, you know, this is my chance. That'll be a thrilling fight. Ray Ford against Magdaleno, brilliant, brilliant fight. Ahmad Aliyev against Tapales, great fight. And I think Gonzalez is going to pose problems for Jesse Rodriguez. He really fancies this fight, you know, and everybody's talking about Jesse Rodriguez. The pressure's on him yep. to look magnificent tonight not just to win or lumber to a points victory but Gonzalez is tough and it's a massive opportunity for him so Jesse's got to go in there and and just make it happen you know go in there take him out and then call out Sonny Edwards in the ring and then we can get it signed on Monday throughout the week have you set the chip on the shoulder with Graham yeah I think you know I think I feel sorry for fighters sometimes because it's definitely the most critical fan base in any sport, isn't it? All of a sudden, it's all with Anthony Joshua last week. Yeah. You know, fights Jermaine Franklin. Then all of a sudden, apparently, Jermaine Franklin's a journeyman. You know, he wins nearly every round. And you just, there's no, there's no, there's no praise coming anywhere. Jesse looks fantastic, steps up against Quadras, beats Rung beside, goes on the Canelo card, fights a very awkward fighter in Israel, Gonzalez, wins on points, and all of a sudden, he's overrated. Yep. He's overhyped. So you're only as good as your last performance. And the reality is, his last performance wasn't sensational. Right. So he'll be looking to make a statement in here, in his hometown. Um, David Diamante said, you guys might know best, the youngest ever two-division world champion. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm going to go with it exactly. anyway because I think it's a great line. Yep. That sounds, sounds about right. First champion born after 2000 back in action tonight, trying to make history in his hometown and become San Antonio's first two-division weight champ. Speaking of David Diamante, we have to throw it to him in the ring as we get set for our main event, Up Before the Bell. continues with a 10-round super welterweight affair. Now making his way to the ring, please welcome Rafael Trouble Ibakwe. Saw Rafael Ibakwe hit the pads in the locker room. Here he is walking out, 30 years of age, out of Houston. A proud second-generation Nigerian-American and is 16-3 with seven knockouts. Ibakwe trains under Bobby Benton, who's the same trainer as world champs Regis Progre and Oshaki Foster. But it's Ibakwe, whom Benton called the toughest guy in his gym in Houston. Rafael Ibakwe is ending a year and a half layoff after he suffered a knockout defeat to Sarei Boachuk, but he has been in the gym the entire time as several fight dates have fallen through. Not this one tonight. Tonight, he has a chance to return in a very big way. Set to make his ring walk, please welcome Israel, the dream a dream of. As we said with Eddie Hearn, it is not often a fighter like Israel Madrimov makes an appearance on before the bell, but when they do, we savor it here. Madrimov, a legitimate world title contender, 8-0-1. That last number, the result of the technical draw with Michael Soro last July at O2 Arena in London. And the rematch stopped due to a Soro cut from an accidental headbutt. Madrimov is itching to get back in the ring, move forward with the hopes of moving closer to world title contention and uh, with the hopes that Soro is not in his future. Not because he doesn't want to face him and it doesn't feel like he's not as good, but...
Ladies and gentlemen from San Antonio, Texas, live on The Zone, we are set to go with a special super welterweight contest. It's all being brought to you courtesy of Mr. Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing in association with World of Boxing. We're sponsored by Bet Online, O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day, and stage front. Introducing your three judges scoring this contest from ringside. From Texas, Javier Alvarez. From California, Sergio Caiz. And from Texas, Jesse Reyes. And at the sound of the bell, your third man in the ring, from Puerto Rico, referee Luis Pabon. And now, ladies and gentlemen, 10 rounds of boxing scheduled in the super welterweight division. Introducing first, Fighting out of the red corner, wearing the silver trunks with the green trim. He scaled 160 pounds, bang on. His professional record, 16 victories against three defeats. He has seven wins coming by way of knockout. He fights out of Houston, Texas, by way of Nigeria. Please welcome Rafael Trouble Ibakwe. Ibakwe. And his opponent across the ring fighting out of the blue corner. He wears the white trunks with the black trim. He scaled 158.8 pounds. He is undefeated in his campaign as a professional with a record of eight wins, no defeats, one draw with six wins coming by way of knockout. Fighting out of Indio, California, by way of Kiva, Uzbekistan. Please welcome the 2017 Asian Championship gold medalist, the 2018 Asian Games gold medalist, and the former WBA Intercontinental Super Welterweight Champion, the undefeated Israel, the Dream Madrimov. Madrimov. Okay, guys, I give you instruction in the dressing room. They're having a game match, okay? Good luck, God bless you. Luis Pabon giving final instructions as Techport continues to fill up for the main card beginning at 8 Eastern, 7 local time here in San Antonio. And now the main event here on Before the Bell Israel Madrimov, Rafael Igbakwe. Let's do it from Boeing Center at Techport. Bakwe in the silver trunks with the green tassels and Madrimov white trunks black trim going down the side Madrimov ending the layoff again last in action in July Only has nine pro fights, but Chris we know the amateur pedigree and Asian gold medalist the Asian games I don't know how much rust or a layoff is a factor with a guy like Israel Madrimov No, I I, I would assume that he would be living in the gym. He's done this his whole life. He's got a ton of experience. But he's got a fighter in front of him. For one, he's a southpaw, as you can see, but uh, he's, he's quick-handed. He's got quick feet, explosive, athletic. So no, no easy task in front of Mandramov for someone who's coming off a, a layoff. Really targeting the body of Mandramov. Sticking that jab to the liver, throwing that right hand. Madrimov trying to find a scene against Igbakwe here. When we mentioned Igbakwe's trainer, Bobby Benton, same trainer as Regis Progre. Regis Progre in the house here in San Antonio. Relatively short journey from Houston. Well, we are in Texas after all. When you, you think about some of the other fighters that Benton does train, Again, he called it Bakwe the toughest out of everyone in his gym. Says he gets hit flush, he keeps walking forward. I don't know if that's always a <laughs> good thing here from a coach. <laughs> Ooh, big swing and a miss there from Bakwe. A dream of angling away. Madrimov, you know, those, those guys with those big amateur experience, you can, he makes the ring so small. He cuts off the ring brilliantly. Everything looks effortless.
That's a wide open stance for McBakwe. Akwe looks big in there too. He's got wide shoulders, long arms, big back. 30 years of age, he's 5 feet 10. He has the height advantage over Madrimov. And Madrimov really focusing on the body. Pretty much almost 90% of the punches he's thrown tonight have been to the midsection. There it is again, a hard jab right to the body. Good jab upstairs. And again, Madrimov just making that ring small. Madrimov walking down Igbakwe. Good right hand at the end of round one. Awesome. You earn an autism reward. Awesome. Get more out of getting the job done. I had mentioned Magdramov was really targeting the body. There we saw a combination from McBakwe. But there's that big right hand at the end of the round. McBakwe was coming off those ropes squared up and Majramov cracked him with the right hand down the middle. One of the only headshots he threw in the round. He really focused on, on the body of Agbakwe. Which is smart when you have a fast guy in front of you. Israel Madrimov out of Uzbekistan, though he lives and trains in Indio, California under Joel Diaz. Going for his ninth pro win as we begin round number two in the main event on before the bell. And right away, the focus for Madrimov, the body of Igbakwe. Beautiful, clever head movement there from Madrimov. And Madrimov cracked him with a left hand to the chin moments ago. A little reach around right hand, just missing the chin of Igbakwe. How do you set up defense for a guy who you know is focusing down on downstairs? Well, you, you gotta you gotta strike. You gotta strike to the head because there's openings. Whenever you go to the body, you're always leaving your head open. So Igbakwe's got to counter those body shots by hitting Madrimov to the head just like that. Series of connections from Igbakwe. Oh, another good left hand from Igbakwe. Left hand coming out of the chamber for the 30-year-old from Houston. And we had said in the opener, this is this is no walkover. Igbakwe has some has some some skills in there and some speed. Looks to be big for the weight class. Well, this is Igbakwe's natural weight class. It's at 160. Madrimov Usually a 154 pounder, so he's making his return to the ring at middleweight here. Yeah, he, he does look undersized. I dream off. I don't know if that was necessarily the smartest thing for Ibakwe lowering himself, timing it up was Madrimov with that left hand. Yeah, Ibakwe's got to be careful, not spending too much time on the ropes. Good liver shot there from Madrimov. Dream of digging with that left hook to the body. Cutting a nice angle there. Ooh. Oh, overhand right. Good shot. Igbakwe rocked, and then the left hook from Madrimov. Oh, right hand snaps Igbakwe's head back to near the corner. You can see Madrimov is, is finding his rhythm, getting loose out there. So much for that ring rust. <laughs> can Madrimov compound with those punches that landed moments ago? Igbakwe trying to fight back. Ooh, nice angle there from my dream off and another little push with the hand steps out flows to that side again makes everything look so effortless <laughs> end of round two my dream off finding a rhythm here in San Antonio My dream of 
there we see the defense was able to partially block that, get his head off line. Very clever, just makes you just miss. There he got his head off line, put the right hand right on Igbakwe's head, and then a straight right hand as he backed him out into the ropes once again. There you see Joel Diaz, Madrimov's head trainer, also the cut man. There's the Uzbek faction in support of Israel Madrimov. Madrimov was a, a workout partner of Dmitry Bivol's. He helped him prepare for his win over Canelo Alvarez last May. They were all in tow supporting Bivol. And all those fighters who also train in Indio, they return the favor. They, they travel together here in the U.S. It's so fun to see. They are lively. They enjoy what they're doing. And they root each other on. And so far, Madrimov timing and connecting through two rounds with Igbakwe. Oh, clash of heads there. Oh, nice shots from Igbakwe. Despite the head movement from a dream of Igbakwe landing. I think Abakwe realizing that he needs to fight back. He's got to take charge. He can't just back up against the ropes and look to counter. Yeah, this is the layoff, uh, uh, the end of a layoff, I should say, of a year and a half for Rafael Abakwe. He's been in the gym the entire time. Certain fight opportunities have fallen through, whether it be over money or fights just not happening period but he's been in the gym the entire time he had 25 days notice of this fight taking place and for a guy as he connects with the left hand on madrimov knowing you have that short notice yet you're in the gym much of that preparation could be uh, about the the mental aspect of the game yeah i mean i think that shows you that he's been in the gym he's confident he's willing to take the fight against you know such a tough opponent you know, he knows he's been in the gym. I mean, and, and you mentioned that that 16, 18 month layoff. I mean, his last fight, he did get stopped. So having some time off is not necessarily a bad thing. Ooh. Less than a minute to go in round number three. This one's scheduled for 10. Again, good movement and two punch combo from a dream off. Punching on the move is the Uzbek. I think the size and the speed of Ibakwe is, is giving Madrimov some, some issues. And Ibakwe is being smart. He's using he's using that advantage. He's a, he's the bigger man. He's being physical and awkward and holding and hitting. Oh. Dream of getting cute out of the clinch. But maybe a sign of frustration. Oh, big right hook there. Lands on Majima. And now they're getting lively. End of round three. Each one chipping at each other. That may turn out to be a pivotal round. Yeah. Seems like Ibakwe just has drawn a line in the sand. Definitely the best round of the fight for Mbakwe so far. And really just making it frustrating, making it awkward, landing some good punches, but also using his holding and hitting tactics. That was a nice left hand from Mbakwe. The Uzbek fans. Here for Madrimov later tonight for MJ Akhmedaliev in his WBA and IBF Super Bantamweight title defense against Marlon Tapalis. It's the co-feature for Rodriguez Gonzalez tonight on the zone. Round four underway between Madrimov and Igbakwe. The 
Uzbek chants coming from the crowd here at Tech Court. Radek Bakwe trying to jab through the support and the guard for Madrimov. Trash talk here from Igbakwe. Again, frust using a frustrating style, using his size. Trying to take advantage of whatever he's got to confuse and, and frustrate Madrimov. Good body shot there from Madrimov. How is the size providing an obstacle for Igbakwe over Madrimov? You can see on the inside, uh, he's able, he's not able to, Madrimov is not able to push him around physically, which he normally does. He's, he's using those swipes to, sw to slide over. But Igbakwe is not easy to move, and it's using more energy to try and push him around. Which I believe is why Madrimov has attacked the body so diligently. Good Another shot. shot with the right hand. This is when Madrimov is dangerous. Right hand swipes the chin oh. of Igbakwe, and another. Two right hands upstairs by Madrimov. Mixing up those right hands beautifully. High, low, look high, punch low, look low, punch high. Cut angles. Nice stuff from Madrimov. Madrimov going right back to work. Ooh. And a big right hand again. Hooking through, landing on Igbakwe. Big, big round from Madrimov. Oh. Doing damage upstairs, but not completely abandoning the body work. Doing just enough. All cylinders clicking for Madrimov in round four. And yeah, Madrimov, he, he, a lot, like a lot of those guys with the big amateur backgrounds, he's a rhythm fighter. Once he finds his rhythm, he figures out your rhythm. Very, very difficult man to beat. Love that cutting the angle. Like he's dancing around his opponent. Some deep breaths there from Igbakwe. Vicious right uppercut by Madrimov. Feels like he's relaxing with each punch thrown as well. Falling into that rhythm. Oh! Huge overhand right. Igbakwe needs to stay off those ropes. That's where he's taking the most damage. Hands were fired from Igbakwe in round three. Not the case here in the fourth. As Madrimov has taken over. Oh, another right hand. Oh, and a liver shot. The That's dream tough. slowing Igbakwe down in the fourth. Huge round for Madrimov. Really consistent that round. Landed the best punches of the fight thus far. Mixing up the head and body beautifully. Finding his rhythm, staying relaxed. Not expending or wasting energy. And just getting much more and more precise with his punches. Bang! Huge overhand right. Ikbakwe has sunk chin. That was a massive right hand. Best punch of the fight for Madrimov. And looks like Ikbakwe is breathing pretty heavy here. As we get set for round number five. Big breaths from Igbakwe, the 30-year-old out of Houston, second-generation Nigerian-American, grew up in Houston, went from Igbakwe. Looked like it actually. Rocked Madrimov for a moment, but he came right back. Hey, Israel recovering. Nice uppercut on the inside there. Splits the guard of Ibakwe. And the combos for Madrimov. Oh. Pumping a right hand right to the solar plex. Again, two punches and angle for Madrimov. from Madrimov, timing it perfectly. Nice inside yeah. lead uppercut. Oh. 
impressive punch variation from Adjimov tonight. Really making everything work. Oh, body shot. Punctuating that combo with a left hook. But again, Mbakwe, I mean, he, he's, he's the larger man. He's taking these shots pretty well. Most, most junior middleweights, 154 pounders, go down from these shots from Adjimov. Not this guy. It's a good test for the Uzbek. Gradually, though, looks like he's oh. breaking Ibakwe down as Ibakwe meets Madrimov's right hand, and he's up against the ropes here. Yeah, breaking down is, is what we're picturing, is what we're seeing right now. Madrimov doing a great job of just chipping away, taking the fight out of Ibakwe. You wonder how much of that fourth round took out of Igbakwe as he incurred a lot of punishment like he is right now in round five. Oh, those body shots. Madrimov teeing off upstairs and downstairs. And the answer from Igbakwe did not seem to be have as much steam on it as they were earlier. A lot of heavy breaths coming out of Igbakwe at this point. Right hand Madrimov again spinning out. Madrimov looks completely in control here in the fifth. Left hook by Madrimov. Bakwe is tough. Very, very tough, man. He's taking some big shots upstairs and downstairs. Bakwe trying to answer back. And Bakwe with a little bit of a flurry. Bakwe. Perhaps catching a rhythm and himself near the end of round five, but Madrimov with another impressive round. Ikbakwe dancing to the corner. He might be having fun in there. <laughs> he could have used that energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here we see them trading left hands. That was the shot that I saw that landed very hard on Madrimov. Didn't realize that he landed one as well. Here we see that beautiful head off line right hand that wobbled Igbagwe for a moment. Had him on shaky legs. Inside clash of heads there. Rafael Igbagwe trying to impress in his home state of Texas. And taking deep breaths. Like what he's able to put together near the end of round five. I don't know if it necessarily gave him the round there. Probably not. No. Not at all. I wouldn't say so. Start of round six. Now he's wiggling the hips. What could this lead to? I think the jitterbug? It, I think it's <laughs> I think it's just that he's happy to be back in the ring. You know, he 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 really wanted this fight. He took it on short notice. He's obviously in good shape. Bakwe coming forward with that punch sequence moments ago. Dreamov clipping him with the right hand. Ooh. And another right Ooh. hand. Compounding it with the left. Good, clean, hard shots. Nice little inside body shot, too. No questioning the heart and toughness of Ikbakwe. Looked like he was having the fight beaten out of him in the fourth and fifth round, but here we are in round six and he's he's back trying to win. Fourth and fifth round looked like it took a lot of win out of Ikbakwe. But this is the Igbakwe that we sort of saw in that third round. Standing toe to toe despite these shots from Madrimov. You see Madrimov pushing him off with that lead hand. Like, man, what is it going to take to get you out of here? He's, he, Madrimov's working very hard in there as well. Israel Madrimov going for his seventh win in the United States. This 10-rounder, those chants from his fans, perhaps fueling him here in San Antonio. This has been a stiff test for Madrimov going up against the bigger opponent. He's outworked Igbakwe. Oh, and Igbakwe coming together with a combo at close range. Good shots there from Igbakwe.
Big breath from Madrimov. Nice counter there from the Dream. Got on his bicycle a little bit, moved around, a couple lateral moves. Madrimov fighting with his mouth open, but again, consistently on the move here. Like Bakwe trying to find his way in, close that distance. You know what I like about Madrimov? He, he tries different things. Like, he, all right, I'm, I'm, I was hitting this guy with everything. He's taking it well. Let me try and move on him, hit him with some side shots he can't see. Oh, nice shot. Here's Real Madrimov forced to use extra tools in his toolbox here tonight. Mentioned the multitude of tricks with Madrimov. If you're seeing Igbakwe kind of experience his second burst, get his second win after all the punishment that you inflicted on him, what do you go towards next? What, what could be next for Madrimov here? Well, I, I like the idea that he had at the end of that last round. He started bouncing on his toes, looking to counter from the outside. You know, he listen, I'm coming in the front door, I'm hitting the guy with everything, he's taking the shots. Let me hit him with some shots he doesn't see. The punches you don't see hurt you the most. So I think he's trying something a little bit different, which I like, I like that idea. He already beat his body. He hit him with some big shots upstairs. Two punch combo upstairs by Madrimov. And again, on the move. And the punch that seemed to stagger Igbagwe the most was a counter right hand. He slid his head offline. Igbagwe didn't see it and wobbled him. So I think Madrimov is, is gonna try that tactic by staying on the outside a little bit more. That punch came in the early rounds of this fight. There, oh, shots like that. Sneaky left uppercut by Madrimov. Exactly, those kind of shots you don't see. Those are the ones that hurt the most. Madrimov getting nice and loose out there. It only takes that one punch to fuel you up, correct? Yeah. I Get mean, you in that rhythm. You start finding that rhythm, you, you make that connection, you're like, ooh, I got it. Bakway coming back with a left. Excellent rhythm. Excellent rhythm. Got his timing, his distance. Oh. Finding a left hole. hand by Madrimov. Finding a hole for that lead uppercut. Going upstairs, now downstairs with that right hand. Madrimov. Shake, rattle, and roll here in the seventh round. Big crack with that right hand. And Madrimov's doing some real pretty stuff in there. Oh, and another combo. Again, punctuated with the left hook. Those are two that landed flush on Igbakwe. Those body shots have to be adding up. And then there's the frustration of having a guy in front of you that you can't hit. And now he's dance dancing around you, spinning, hitting you like that. Ibakwe coming in, met with a right hand. It's a little different when you're in there landing punches, but when you're missing everything and getting beat up, that's a whole different mentality. Ooh, good shot again. Another left hand from Madrimov. This round, the fourth round, we're seeing what makes the complete package for Israel Madrimov. We're seeing different things in these rounds that stand out, but it all adds up. So many layers to this man as a fighter. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very impressive. And this is why he is one of the best in the world. And we're, go we're going to see him in these big fights very soon. Pleasure to have him on Before the Bell. Absolutely. <laughs> and the top ranking by the WBA. And Madrimov with one of his most impressive rounds of the fight there in the seventh.
here we see those shots that I was talking about, trying to hit Ikbakwe with the shots he doesn't see, and a lot of that is coming off the rhythm and movement, the freestyling of Madrimov at this point. There he cuts angles, changing directions, really showing himself to be a hard target and a free-flowing puncher off of his movement. Offense and defense together, this is what the sweet science is all about. Madrimov putting on a, a master class. Madrimov off his stool first, getting ready to go for round number eight, scheduled for 10. Let's see if Madrimov can push the pedal even further. Bakwe is earning his money tonight. Hanging in tough, but outgunned and outclassed. Dream of sneaking the left hand inside, coming back with the right hand to the chin of Igbakwe. And again, on the move. Loosening up the shoulders, good head movement, keeping the feet busy. Hadrimov looks like he's sparring in there. Such exquisite head movement, and then he comes back with a shot to the gut. He's fighting the bigger opponent. And even in the later rounds, it looks like it's easier for Israel Madrimov. Yeah, I, I, it looks like he's taking some of the power off of his shots now. And I think he might be okay with getting a decision. He's not taking any shots now, not taking any punishment, letting his hands go, but not digging down like he was earlier. Nice right Stick hand. Right hand and another one. Oh. All right, he's that got a hurt. May have woken up Madrimov to press the issue a little further. Overhand right by Israel. And just when I said he took some of the heat off his punches, he <laughs> throws a couple fastballs. Cracks Ibakwe. Oh, right hand landing on Ibakwe again. You, you see the breathing of Ikbakwe. Definitely labored, a lot of body shots, hard work. Also, his punches don't have the same snap. A little bit of pushing on those punches now coming out. Madrimov still showcasing the quality movement. A duck under there. Didn't follow it with a punch. And again, Angles, the name of the game with Madrimov. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Madrimov needs to be careful not to do too much movement in front of Ibakwe without throwing punches. Final 10 seconds of round eight. Ooh. Trying to go for a hammer uppercut, didn't get it. Ibakwe comes up empty with the right hook. Shot at the bell. For through eight. Given what we were seeing in the earlier rounds, I did not think that this is how it would look in some of these latter rounds. No, I mean, it, it looked like Majorbal was having his way early on and, and potentially could have gotten a buck way out of there, but he's held on tough. And I think the size is a big part of it. You know, he's a, he's, he's a big man in there. And you can tell Madrimov is, is laboring to deal with him physically, and, and he's taking the punches really well. Bakwe's shown his toughness in this fight. Again, ending a year and a half layoff with his return to the ring. But his punches have slowed down in the latter half of this fight after taking some serious punishment in the fourth and fifth rounds. Seemed like he responded well. 
As Badrimov chips away with a couple of left hands, but rounds six, seven, eight here in the ninth. Badrimov definitely a step ahead and has taken over in this scheduled 10 rounder. And again, the defense on display and he followed it up with throwing that right hand. Hey, Bakwe, this is the most output he's put together in a few rounds. Having some success, though, is, is landing a, f a few of those shots on the end of Majimov's head movement. Can he continue it over the length of the round? He saw first 30, 40 seconds as he gets tagged. Igbakwe has shown to come out more busy and then slow down. I mean, that's a testament to the work that Madrimov put in. And I do think fatigue is starting to set in a little bit for both men. Yeah. But overhand right for Madrimov. That's how Madrimov's output is definitely starting to come down. Defense still there, movement still good, but not punching as often or as hard as he was a few rounds ago. Oh, there's a hard one. But Dreamoff tags him with a right. And a left hand to follow another one. Ibakwe ate that as he continues to throw, but Madrimov starting to throw harder punches here in the ninth round. Ibakwe has some chin. Some of those overhand rights from the outside have been massive. I guess this was the durability that Bobby Benton was alluding to. He was not lying. <laughs> he is a very tough man. And still throwing back. No Bakwe. quit in this man. Bakwe trying to stand toe to toe with Israel Madrimov. Madrimov getting closer with a few jabs. Left hook to the body. Another jab. And Bakwe stumbling out of the corner. Yeah, Bakwe's look like he's getting weaker and weaker. 20 seconds here in round nine. Madrimov pushing the tempo up. I think if Madrimov can put together some big shots in a row, might be able to force a stoppage here. Oh, good body shot. Wide open left hook to the body. <laughs> Impressive ninth round as both fighters turn it up just a bit as we move on to the 10th and final coming up. Big right hand from Madrimov. Another huge overhand right. Crashes in on the side of the head of Ibakwe, who's been taking them very well, but this round, he seems to be withering under the assault of Madrimov. Work and showing a lot of class and craft in there. Last three minutes of the fight, Israel Madrimov in control, looking to improve to 9-0-1. But Rafael Lukbakwe, the bigger fighter, he has shown durability. He's been a tough out for the Uzbek here think, in the 10th and final round. I think Madrimov's going to go for it. I was wondering if he was going to be okay with the decision or if he's going to go for the knockout. Look, it does look like he's going to go for it. There's a right hand, another one from Madrimov. The punches in the ninth round having a big impact on Ibakwe, like Chris was saying moments ago. Madrimov trying to carry those over from the ninth. Madrimov now fighting at the southpaw position, loading up with right hooks. He switches it up, cracks him with a right hand to the body. I think Madrimov is asking what Ibakwe is made out of, because he is <laughs> Pounding him all night long. And it's Ibakwe trying to charge forward a bit. Oh, left hook to the body again. 
Madrimov finding a home near that liver of Igbakwe. But even those shots not slowing Igbakwe down here in the 10. Igbakwe lands a left. Both fighters packing some some heavy rocks in their punches here in the 10th. Good body shot again. Bakwe just takes it. Both fighters teeing away with a minute 10 to go. Oh, Madrimov going for it with that left hand. Igbakwe standing toe to toe. Madrimov not oh. much movement. But he finds that right hand to rifle Igbakwe upstairs. And now Igbakwe slowed down. That was an impactful punch. Igbakwe's mouth hanging open. I wonder if he has an injured jaw. A lot of times when you hurt your jaw, you're unable to close it. Oh, that overhand right moments ago, perhaps paving a path for Madrimov here in the final 30 seconds. And Igbakwe still coming forward. This has been a quality showing for both fighters for different reasons. Yes, I, I agree. Oh, left hand doing damage. And another one upstairs, the left hook. Oh, hand by Madrimov and Igbakwe still on his feet. I was going to say, all this punishment, he's never gone down. Both glancing up at the clock. And that'll do it. What a fight. Man. What a fight. Igbakwe showed a lot of heart, but it's Madrimov, perhaps with a lot and way more skills. Nevertheless, that was a quality fight to close it out on before the bell. Really excellent performance from Madrimov. Israel Madrimov doing a terrific job. Backflip the boot. He's feeling it. Welcome back. Welcome back is right. As if Junior Middleweight didn't need another monster in it. <laughs> Look at these beautiful angles and moves, setting up the power punches. You know, I, I believe that my dream of was a little tired at the end of the fight, as he should be, throwing big shots all night long in the 10th round. Was making the punches count that much more, making his opponent miss and cracking him with big single shots, trying to get him out of there. Almost dropped him at the end of the round, but Ibakwe, super tough, super durable, able to survive. And again, we have to mention, this is as big of a fighter that Madrimov probably encountered, especially as a pro. This was at 160 pounds. Madrimov naturally at 154. And Igbakwe was the bigger fighter. Yeah, that was obvious from, from the opening bell, and I think that had a lot to do with how much punishment Igbakwe was able to, to take. So a terrific test for Madrimov, likely passing it. It'd be very surprising if he doesn't come away with the win. Very much should, and we are moments away from making it official. We get a nice round of applause out here for both of these fighters, please. After 10 rounds of action here in San Antonio, we go to the judges' score totals. They read as follows. Javier Alvarez, 100 to 90. Sergio Calles, Jesse Reyes, both have it 99 to 91. All three for your winner by unanimous decision. He's still undefeated Israel. The dream a dream of. A near shutout on the cards for the dream. Israel Madrimov impressing in Texas. And he will go back to Indio, California with his seventh win in the United States as he improves to 9 0 and 1. But it was not easy despite those wide scorecards. Rafael Ibakwe put up a fight, and Madrimov earned that wide unanimous decision. Yeah, and honestly, I think that's a good comeback fight. He got the 10 rounds in. He was in there with a tough, bigger man. 
He had the, he showed a lot of his game tonight. Good win. See some of Madrimov's team, including Redeem Kordalov, his manager, and Joel Diaz in the red vest. As they pick up another victory, and they return in style here in San Antonio. Israel Madrimov with the victory now. Again, 9-0-1. Is enough to tank for the gymnastics, Chris. Peace. At the 10 hard rounds, still banging out backflips. Taking a look at some of the action throughout the 10 rounds. Rafael Bakwe came to fight, came to make a point, had to sit on a loss, but Madrimov took over at certain points. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he asserted himself early on, but Bakwe showed that he was a capable guy. Super, super durable. The punches that Madrimov was landing all night long to the head and to the body were fantastic. He showed great defense, beautiful lateral movement, in and out. Great rhythm throughout as well. Some of the rounds where uh, uh, Nick Bakwe had some success, landed some shots, but for the most part, it was all Madrimov. Power punches coming from every angle. He tried everything, pulled every play out of his playbook to try and get Ikbakwe out of there, but Ikbakwe tough, having fun in there, dancing. Madrimov started to really pour it on in the last few rounds. You could tell he really wanted that stoppage, but Ikbakwe just would not be denied. He wanted to make it to the distance. There were certain points where it felt like Madrimov was really going for it, backed off the pedal, stepped back on. He used his judgment. Yeah, I think he was smart. Again, he had a big, a big man in front of him, a guy who had quick hands as well, southpaw. You know, there were certain certain aspects of, of his game that are something to deal with. And But, he, I mean, Madrimov passed with, with flying colors. I think it was a fantastic performance, top to bottom. Again, Madrimov improving to 9-0-1. Oh, Igbakwe falling to 16-4. and four. But a gutsy showing for Igbakwe as we welcome you back to our set here on Before the Bell. Chris Algieri, Justin Shackle with you. So it's been a, a fantastic four fights to open up the show here in San Antonio. Madrimov caps it off with his ninth victory. Let's show you what's coming up on the main card beginning 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central here on the zone. It'll get started with Thomas Batiste and Ramiro Cesena. A very good super featherweight match. And then at 126 pounds, the one that a lot of people have been eyeing, Raymond Ford, the former champ, Jesse Magdaleno. Crossroad fight personified between Ford and Magdaleno, the co-feature for the WBA and IBF World Super Bantamweight titles. MJ Akhmadaliev getting in the ring with the former world champ, Marlon Zipalis, as Zipalis tries to become a two-division world champ. And speaking of that two-division desire, same story for Jesse Bam Rodriguez in the main event, the former WBC super flyweight titleist who vacated that belt. He's moving back down to 112 to take on Christian Gonzalez with the hopes of becoming a two-division world champ and set some local history. San Antonio rich in boxing tradition. Bam Rodriguez trying to become the first ever two division world titleist from San Antonio. Quickly, your picks here for the main event. Bam Gonzalez with everything on the line and everything that could be coming in 2023 for the 112 pound division. Yeah, I mean, massive, massive fight, historical implications. Bam, a superstar, was this close to being fighter of the year last year. Only got beat up by Dimitri Bivol, which there's no, no shame in that. But no, massive, massive fight. And like Eddie Hearn said, Christian Gonzalez can fight. So I think this is going to be a test for Bam, for Bam as well. Gonzalez is the taller fighter. He's the rangier fighter. He also, over the last couple of fights, if you take a look at the CompuBox numbers, he is throwing more than Bam Rodriguez and above the 112-pound division average in terms of punches per round. So something interesting to watch for is it is going to be a test for Bam Rodriguez. How high? We're going to have to wait and see. That comes up later tonight. The main card beginning 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central, here in San Antonio on the zone. For Chris Algieri, for our entire matchroom crew, thank you for watching Before the Bell. Tune in again, 8 p.m. Eastern on the zone, and we hope you enjoy Rodriguez Gonzalez.
champions and they're fighting like champions.